Turner. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the November 22nd, 2022 monthly MFAC meeting. At this time, I commend the participation of members at the many public hearings conducted by DMF staff since the summer. That being said, we have many action items to approve or disapprove today. Between the public hearings and the director's recommendations, which you've all received, please let's keep the questions and comments pertinent to the specific recommendation. And at this time, I'll move the meeting to Commissioner Ron Amadin. Thank you, Chairman Kane. Um, glad to be here today to uh, listen to you folks uh, review this very uh, busy agenda. And uh, I'll keep my comments to a minimum. I, I want to let you folks know that uh, my team at the department level have worked very hard at uh, collecting data and information from DMF with regards to the economic development project uh, bill that's been signed off by the governor. Um, we have, I believe, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 28 projects that we have submitted department wide up through EEA to the governor for consideration totaling almost $155 million. Um, so if we can get uh, a small portion of those requests that we've asked them to consider, uh, we'll all be in a far better place. That's, uh, it's taken up an awful lot of time of my team collecting uh, information from the four different divisions. And as always, DMF has done an exemplary job of answering those requests and pro providing us with all of the information we needed to do uh, a very professional presentation. Um, with that, um, I would like to also ask that the commission consider um, sending out a, a letter of thanks and congratulations to the outgoing administration, whereas they have been uh, very supportive of this board uh, and very supportive of, of DMF in the department. Um, I wanted to make sure that you folks considered something like this in a timely fashion. Uh, so that's why I bring it up here today. And um, maybe uh, in the not so distant future, we, uh, we send a, a letter of congratulations along to the incoming administration. And with that, sir, that will conclude my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I don't know, Jared, can we put that on the agenda? The Commissioner's recommendation that we submit a letter to the outgoing and incoming administrations. If that is uh, your wish, Mr. Chair, I can work with you on drafting that and uh, we could circulate a letter um, later this month for review. Well, so be it, Let, let's do that. That's a great recommendation from the Commissioner. He's very thoughtful of the present administration and the incoming. And I think it would be appropriate for us to send those letters out. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Moving on to law enforcement, who's on today? Lieutenant Bass or? Yes, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think uh, Lieutenant Colonel Pat Moran is also on, but I think we can be a uh, pretty brief. Uh, we're still on uh, nothing significant to report uh, a lot of our cases are still kind of moving through the courts uh, a lot of court time um uh, you're probably aware it looks like whales are continuing to make the news um we are already getting a jump on some of that recreational gears there's a recreational closure going on right now uh, we did have some joint training with the nymphs um, they've um, purchased some extra kind of high-tech equipment that they anticipate using for whale and speed enforcement so we um so we did two days of training with with some of their new stuff uh we did have i think a pretty productive uh law enforcement subcommittee meeting but i do see that on the agenda later so i'll just uh, wait till that comes up in the agenda um but i think nothing much else to report if there's any questions any questions for lieutenant bass Derek? i'm not seeing any hands raised thank you lieutenant bass We'll move on to Director Dan McKiernan. Dan. 
Thank you, Raymond. Thank you, and, and great to be here today. First, I want to thank the commission for agreeing to this venue change at the last minute. Um, it just kind of uh, dawned on us uh, the end of last week as we heard um, a, a couple of staffers who who gathered uh, in a meeting and you know came down with a couple of COVID cases. We don't know if they were related, but it just made sense to try to minimize uh, exposures as we all kind of approach the holidays. So thanks for responding to me on Friday night when we came up with this last minute decision. Um, since our last meeting, I've been on the road a lot, uh, which is pretty rare for me, but um, I, I attended the San Diego National Directors Meeting, which was postponed for two and a half years due to COVID. And uh, follow, following that, uh, uh, Raymond and I uh, and some of the staff were at the ASMFC annual meeting in New Jersey. Um, and prior to that, I took a week off and I toured the California coastline, uh, you know, as a, as a vacation and uh, saw some of the most amazing um, coast and but also amazing access to uh, to the waterfront that California enjoys. It was really uh, inspiring. Um, while I was away, my amazing staff kept the trains running, including conducting uh, public hearings uh, in my absence, and I am truly grateful for all the work they did uh, while I was gone. Um, we, you, some of you heard uh, as we began the meeting or prior to the meeting that the COD story map, uh, this was a, a project that um, the department had asked us to do kind of a wrap up report of, of, all, the, of uh, all the work that uh, Micah Dean and his team did on on the industry-based survey and the other groundfish-related research that was uh, uh, supported uh, by Governor Baker uh, right at the beginning of his term, and you know the we we thought about writing a you know a glossy report, but um, these days you know the game is, uh, is is social media and electronic media, so we opted to do. Um, something a little different, something we haven't done before, and uh, we'll be sending that out to you uh, probably in the next day or two. Um, uh, Ron um, spoke highly of it, and I want to thank some of the commission members, specifically Khalil and, and some of the other staff who who served as uh, editors and uh, and helped it become any, an even better product. Um, the Shellfish Advisory Panel met last week. Uh, that is that is a uh, it's different than this commission and that it doesn't have regulatory authority, but they, they do serve a similar function, but uh, focus exclusively on our shellfish issues and Bill Doyle is a member of that. And I thought we had a really uh, a productive meeting. Uh, it's an interesting venue because uh, it has very minimal uh, internet access. It's in kind of a bunker. So when you gather a t uh, in a room like that, people are very focused. <laughs> and to, to, to our advantage. So we had great discussions, great feedback, and we're working on a number of issues with them. Uh, in the months ahead, I'm gonna be coming back to you with some uh, ideas about surf clam management. And this is being precipitated uh, for, by, for a couple of reasons. First, uh, our surf clam regulations are over 40 years old. They really haven't been amended much uh, over that time period. It's probably appropriate to take a look at them. But uh, the, the more uh, relevant uh, reason has to do with the uh, Wetlands Protection Act authority, especially regarding the town of Provincetown. This is uh, an issue you may have heard about in the past, but back um, you know, in the last decade or so, uh, Provincetown exercised uh, authority under the Wetlands Protection Act to prohibit hydraulic surf clam dredging uh, in their in, in certain town waters, and um, and the courts uh, upheld that, and so uh, we have a very complicated uh, situation with surf clams because the uh, in theory the the Conservation Commission could put uh, permit conditions on, on, if they would allow it under their authority or under the Wetlands Protection Act, they could put permit conditions on it, which would basically usurp our authority and, and your authority to, uh, to exercise uh, that which is given to you under 17A, which is the ability to approve regulations about the times, manner, places, and quantities of fish that may be taken. So 
but nobody's really comfortable with this arrangement. And so I think uh, now it's been about a decade since those rules were enacted. The current Conservation Commission, I believe, is a little bit more amenable to trying to work out a, a better solution. So um, this is going to require, you know, a gaggle of lawyers. Um, but I I'm, I'm really um, interested in, in resolving this once and for all and finding a way uh, out of this mess and to kind of regain some of the authority uh, in that and, and also to prevent prevent this kind of a thing from spreading from town to town to town where, where um, basically the surf climb fishery could be knocked out by a collection of, of um, NIMBY towns that, that don't want this activity to take place in their water. So anyway, a little bit more detail than you're probably ready for, but I will be coming back to you in the future and just want to give you a heads up on that. Uh, the offshore wind uh, development issues continue to spin in the background. Uh, the Vineyard Wind One cable that is coming through Muskegon Channel is being laid this month, and the uh, the construction of those turbines is expected next year. Uh, meanwhile, I've been working with Coastal Zone Management and many of the other states to develop strategies and an and, and a and a method of of creating a single entity that would give out compensation uh, funds or, or mitigation funds for, to displaced fishermen or fishermen affected. So, for example, when the when the uh, um, when the turbines are under construction, people have to stay out of the area completely and the, the offshore wind companies are prepared to compensate those affected by that. And, you know, these are all in federal waters. So it's, it's, kind, of, uh, it's kind of clunky for a state to be negotiating that like one state at a time. And so, especially when you have an area where multiple states vessels are fishing in that area. So uh, we're hoping that, that, you know, we meaning many of the states are hoping we could devise like, like an agreement among all the states to have a single entity be handing out these funds uh, based on the uh, standard uh, protocols or the standard, uh, uh, you know, um, a standardized approach for how much money should be given out and for what purposes. Uh, and and those, uh, those guidelines are being developed by what's called BOEM, the Bureau of Offshore Energy Management. So that's that's going on in the background, and then finally, um, I'm on the verge of hiring a a new employee to work on some of these offshore wind issues for DMF, uh, and I'm just awaiting uh, our HR department to to make that person an offer. And I'm looking forward to to bringing that person on because it, it is an issue that does tie many of my staff up, and uh, like somebody like Story Reed and Anna Webb, um, you know Melanie Griffin. At times, we we have to scramble to drop things when. The, the wind issues come up. So um, we're hoping to get an, a full-time employee on to, to do some of that for us. So I'll stop there. Um, I'll take any questions that, that anyone might have on, on uh, but I think we've got a lot of business that we'll be talking about things going forward. But if there's anything that's, you know, seeing on the agenda that you'd want to have questions about, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Director. Any questions for Director Dan McKiernan? Jared, any hand? I'm not seeing any hands, Mr. Chair. Well, let's move right into action items and review of final recommendations. Right. Okay. Um, Jared's got a, a very uh, nice PowerPoint. We're going to go over these one by one. This opening slide, you may have seen this in the public hearing presentation, uh, effectively describes the um, the the timing of of what it is we're doing. We hope to get these rules all in place um, just prior to the, uh, uh, the departure of the outgoing administration. So uh, we write here, you know, executive review and promulgate final regs. That's, um, we're hoping, I mean, it's kind of a jump ball whether we can get the, uh, you know, sufficient um, uh, attention uh, of the folks in the administration, but we're hopeful that we can get these done. Um, so next slide, Jared. All right, the first one is uh, Atlantic uh, mackerel permitting, which will be done in combination with the, uh, with the recreational bag limit. So if you recall, the um, Mid-Atlantic Council uh, was initiating some new conservation for mackerel, and obviously they, they can lower the commercial quotas, but there was uh, concerns that the recreational catch of mackerel was substantial and needed to be addressed. 
the, the challenge that the Mid-Atlantic Council had on that issue is that most of the recreational catch occurs A, in state waters, and B, in New England states' waters, specifically uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. And so it was a little awkward where the, uh, we, you know, the, the council that doesn't include any of those three states was pursuing this. And so we worked collaboratively with our other two states to the north, Maine and New Hampshire, and with the Mid-Atlantic Council uh, staff to um, uh, work with them to devise uh, you know, a, an appropriate uh, bag limit, which is something we're gonna be talking about next. Uh, but it's important to, um, to delineate or to, uh, to count the catch attributable to the recreational versus the commercial. And so one, one effective way that we do that as fishery managers is to, um, when you do have a, a bag limit, is to require a commercial permit for any vessel that is exceeding that. And so, um, you know, on one hand, you know, that's, that's something you, you probably frown upon, like you wouldn't want that happening with the striped bass fishery, for example, because you don't want someone subverting the recreational rules simply by buying a commercial permit. But in the case of, um, of, of mackerel, this is the, you know, it's a first time uh, uh, we've ever had a bag limit. And uh, we, we, we simply need to enumerate this catch effectively uh, for management going forward. And so we are proposing to, um, to create this permit. And I know there was, there was some concerns about the adoption of this rule, especially by uh, for higher oper vessel operators who would go out in the morning and maybe catch um, the, enough fish for the day for their clients and then come back in um, and pick up the clients and go fishing. And, um, you know, we're pretty comfortable uh, with the proposal, maintaining the proposal, which is to create this permit for this upcoming fishing season, uh, or this upcoming calendar year, I should say. Uh, it'll be open entry, uh, just standard $30, uh, uh, what we call a, uh, a regulated uh, fishery permit endorsement. And, asking that, uh, you know, that anybody who buys this permit, and if they're not selling the fish, to enumerate that on a catch report and um, record that as personal use. Uh, on the other hand, as pointed out in, in this, uh, this last uh, bullet, that we do have a rule that you're not supposed to mix commercial and recreational trips. So, you know, we don't want people out like recreationally fishing for, uh, for like, uh, you know, striped bass and taking an excessive quantity uh, of mackerel. We think 20 is a good number and that's 20 per angler. So if you have two people on the boat, that's 40. If you have three people, that's 60. I'm pretty confident that that is a safe uh, number. And so we're gonna get to that obviously next, but this first proposal is to create a permit specifically for Atlantic mackerel. Jared, is there, uh, do you wanna fill in any, any gaps? Yeah, um, in terms of procedure, uh, this doesn't require a motion. Uh, this is a permitting um, adjustment. So uh, it doesn't require a motion and MS impact vote, but we are looking for um, any any discussion pro or con from the commission to inform whether or not to move forward with this as recommended. Thanks. Uh, questions for the director or Jared? Not seeing any questions, Mr. Chair. So my question is on the last bullet, commercial anglers may not mix commercial and recreational trips. So in essence, what you're saying is the captain and crew will go out prior to picking up their charter and catch uh, a number of mackerel or are they allowed to take the charter out and be allowed 20 fish per angler with the commercial doors. Well, they can take the 20 fish uh, per angler up to 20, just as is, because that's the new recreational limit. If they feel they yeah. need more than 20, like let's say they've got a, a, a you know six customers and they feel that uh, like just one captain, so let's say he's got, um, he's just him. He could go out and get more than 20 under the authority of the commercial permit and come in and then conduct a different trip 
as a for hire. So that's that's how we're we're treating this. Yeah, and and that's addressed in a bit more detail in the next um, proposal regarding the um, regarding the uh, limit itself rather than the the permit. Okay. Mike Tiernock. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a question, uh, just to clarify, uh, if one is fishing for bluefin tuna and they're a properly permitted vessel, uh, charter boat vessel, uh, they have the ability to fish recreationally or commercially. So in that case, what's the, the limitation on the permit that they would be able to uh, obtain? So the the existing um, regulation does carve out an exemption for um, certain species, federally managed species um, that are opportunistically caught, such as bluefin tuna, um, where you may go out intending to catch a commercial sized bluefin tuna and not do that, or you may run into a commercial sized bluefin tuna and we don't want a state rule that was really designed to address um, other fisheries issues to have to be discarded because you're, you have recreational fish on board. So what that means is that if you're out recreationally fishing, the, or if you're out fishing recreationally and you catch a bluefin tuna, you can retain that bluefin tuna if it's of legal size and and sell it. Um, so if you are going out bluefin tuna fishing, you can fish under the recreational um, mackerel limit and, and retain a commercial bluefin tuna, or you can fish under the commercial mackerel limit provided that all the remainder of your catch conforms with the commercial fishing rules. Additional question. Sure. One does not declare whether they are recreational or, or commercial until the fish is landed. Correct. So I go back to the dock and I want to have sufficient mackerel in excess of 20. I get the commercial permit and then I have the ability to keep those fish in the pen at my dock. Correct. I, I don't follow the question, Mike. I'm sorry. And 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 this gets into the next um, um, issue of, of the limit. Is is that right? Yeah. I mean, you had some for hire uh, comments that uh, they needed more than twenty because they put them in a pen, um, and that would not provide them the uh, ability to do that unless they were. Uh, commercial I, I don't but mike if they bought the commercial permit they can go take as many as they want and put them in a pen okay i'm just pointing that out because technically you you've clarified that but for the record one does not declare whether they're commercial or recreational until the fish is landed at the boat so if i'm out there recreationally fishing i may just uh go I well, Mike, I, I, I disagree with that presumption. Um, the the action of becoming a recreational or commercial angler is going to occur the moment you retain a fish um, in non-conformity with one or the other sets of rules. Agreed. So oh. the moment you take that 21st mackerel, you're a commercial fisherman. Your catch has to all your catch on board your vessel has to conform with commercial fishing regulation. Or the moment you retain a 28 inch striped bass, you're a recreational angler, and all the catch on board the vessel has to conform with the recreational fishing regulations. So when I have that permit, that HMS permit that provides me the ability to recreationally and commercially land and sell a bluefin tuna, I can have the commercial mackerel permit and retain more than 20 at the dock correct 
Okay. All, all the the exemption, the bluefin tuna exemption to the mixing trips rule. What that tries to accomplish is if you go out and you take two stripe, if you take your one stripe bass, um, you know, in the recreational slot limit in the morning, and you know, you run across a school of tuna later in the day on your way home, say, or or you go out and you and you end up catching that giant. You know, we don't want you to discard that recreational striped bass to keep the giant or discard the giant because you want to keep the striped bass. You know, because of the opportunistic nature of that bluefin tuna fishery, you know, we, we, that exemption exists insofar as what the macro, how this applies to the macro rule is once you, you can retain macro under either limit, but if, if you, or you can retain bluefin tuna regardless of, of how you're permitted for Atlantic mackerel. Right. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah. I appreciate the clarification, thank you. Okay, Jared, you know, I had a follow-up because I also saw emails, say a charter boat has two charters and they can only find the mackerel on the first charter. If the boat has a commercial permit, if the boat captain, owner of the vessel has a commercial permit, can say they have three, four hires. So that allows them 60 plus the captain's 20, I presume. But if he has a commercial permit and he knows he's not gonna find any mackerel later in the day for a second charter, can he retain more than 20 mackerel? That was my question. Well, Ray, it's not 20 per boat, it's 20 per person on the boat. That's what I just said. So in the morning, he has a charter, three angles. So there's 60 mackerel, plus yep. the captain, there's an additional 20. But if they go through their mackerel as owner of the boat and he retains a commercial permit, can he land more than 20 mackerel when they're on them, catching them in the morning for his afternoon charter? No. Well, well oh. wait, Ray, why did you go back to 20? Because it's not well, 20 Yeah, they can boat. take it's 80 mackerel. Right. If there's four people on the boat, they can take 80 mackerel under the recreational fishing limits. Right. If it's a charter, they can't take more than those 80 mackerel if there's only four people on the boat, regardless of how that individual is, is permitted on the commercial end because they're not commercial fishers. Thank you. What he what, what we are in the next slide, what we'll get to is to address some of the public comment that we got is that you can we would allow a commercial a charter boat to go out prior to their charter and take more than the recreational limit if it's the charter captain in the main, more than 40 fish, under the authority of a commercial permit, come and pick up their, their, um, the morning charter, the morning charter. So say that's a hundred, you know, say there's five people on the boat. So that's a hundred mackerel. Um, then they could go out and bring those, that morning charter on and, and they would be fully compliant. But so if they go through the hundred mackerel, what becomes of the charter in the afternoon if they have no mackerel? They They'd have to jig up more mackerel. Yeah. It, it's or, fine. Okay. Is Thank it you. is it worth mentioning? And correct me if I'm wrong. That I'm just like the recreational officer. I mean, they can they can. It's just the possession limit is for while you're fishing. So you go out and catch your twenty per person, and then car them up at the dock. Go out and get more. Your the the fish that are carred up. At your slip aren't counting against your daily limit they if they're harvested that day they are technically it's a it's a yep. it's a daily harvest limit and a possession limit while fishing but you could car up fish at the dock and those fish car to the dock from previous days out. Yep. yeah for previous days sort of like how the uh recreational lobster limit applies Okay, any other questions for Jared on this? Is enforcement comfortable with Jared's statement? Uh, makes sense to me. 
Okay, thank you, Matt. So where do you want to go from here? Well, we'll go, no, the, <laughs> we'll go to the limit. Yeah, if there was no objections, Ray, then uh, I'm going to go forward and enact a, a permit requirement for 2023 okay. with no objections. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody object or are there any objections? Not seeing any hands raised. Okay. Now, I, I committed a big boo boo, gentlemen. You know, we never approved the agenda for today. We never reviewed the October business meeting. So, can we step back to that or? Sure. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, review the November agenda. And you don't need. Uh, any Unless there's amendments to the agenda, we do not need a uh, motion. Okay. Are there any changes to today's agenda, gentlemen? Not seeing any hand raised. Thank you. And re review and approval of the October 18th business meeting. Any Make a motion to approve. I need a second. Second. Second by Khalil. All those in favor? Uh, requires a roll call, Mr. Chair. You want to call it, Jared, being how you know who's in attendance? Sure thing. Uh, Sookie Sawyer? Yes. Bill Amaru? Yes. Bill Doyle? Yes. Tim Brady? Yes. Lou Williams? Yeah, Lou is not able to uh, connect. Uh, all right. Um, Shelly Edmondson? I'll be abstaining. I was absent at that meeting. Mike Peardnock? Yes. I, 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 Khalil, yes. Uh, oh, Khalil, I'm sorry. It's Khalil. That's okay. Yes. All right, Mr. Chair, that passes. Thank you very much. I guess we can go back to action items. And I think in the future, I will not be calling you gentlemen. I will just be calling you fishers. That is the uh, <laughs> neutral gender expression or term that they want us using in the future. And I was just reprimanded. So I will call you all fishers in the future. No, no longer ladies and gentlemen. So let's move on. All right, Ray, um, the second issue has to do with the 20 fish recreational limit. And that this was what spurred the, the, um, the, the, the previous uh, discussion item. It's, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Middle Atlantic Council uh, and the three New England states kind of worked together to uh, study the uh, MRIP data and uh, to come up with a uh, appropriate bag limit that could uh, constrain catches to uh, target levels. And there was a lot of give and take. And I was pleased at the outcome that, um, that uh, especially from uh, Mike Peridonox group, they uh, provided a lot of input on this, that uh, we settled at, on a 20 fish recreational possession limit. And um, the, uh, the other two states of uh, Maine and New Hampshire are expected to um, adopt similar measures. And so these, these are going to be state measures that are going to complement the federal measures. So it, we're uh, supporting the federal plan. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about um, when this uh, and how this uh, limit is going to apply and to whom. And uh, I don't know if we need to uh, rediscuss that, but obviously it's it's uh, when you're not fishing under the authority of the commercial permit, uh, this, this shall be the new limit. So if you're on a, like a for hire boat, um, I know when I was a kid, you know, a really small kid, you know, we, we, we went out and bought a, caught a barrel of mackerel and then dumped them on my grandfather. And I don't know what he did with them, but uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, they're, they, they, it's, it's possible to catch a very uh, high number of these fish. Um, but, 20 is at least is a was a good compromise and it was something that I think we salvaged out of those negotiations. So the proposal is for a 20 fish recreational limit um, going forward. Thank you. Any Bill, Bill you recognize.
Bill, are you there? I am here. I, I don't know why I was, I was prevented from opening my, my microphone. My question is <clears throat> on counting the 20 mackerel. <clears throat> I, I'd like to be assured that there won't be a requirement that the individual fish be removed from a tank that they may be in if there are 40 or 60 fish. There's going to have to be an assumption that the numbers of fish are pretty close to what the requirement is because if they have to be removed and counted by authorities, they're not gonna make it. In the summertime, the water's warm enough. And uh, I'd just like to know, uh, this was brought up by a, uh, a comment from uh, the public on public comments. And I'd like to know uh, if there's a plan and how it would be uh, structured for counting the mackerel. Lieutenant Bass. <laughs> Yeah, uh, how to do that? I mean, much like counting to tog when there's even 40 of them. But yeah, no, that's a good question. And I and I'd hope it'd be reasonable with the officer. Um, um, I think it'd take a bit of a, a learning curve to figure out what an appropriate amount of mackerel looks like in, in a bait well or, or whatnot. Um, and uh, geez, as far as an absolute um, means or some written way to do that i'm i'm not sure i think uh you know we'd be cognizant that they would be short-lived flopping on the deck maybe to you know transfer from one one bait well to the to the next or, or something but um i i can't myself if, if you know if, if it's 50 mackerel or 70 mackerel i don't think uh an officer would get too upset with 10 over but i'm i'm, I'm thinking for quantities above and beyond that um, so on the, on the charter side, yeah, I can see, see the worry about the, um, the die off. Uh, I think more, we're looking at, um, some of these guys, you know, the people that are out there now that, that aren't keeping them alive, they're just putting them in totes and totes. And, and obviously that's, um, we could count those and it'd be obvious that they need a commercial permit, but, um, a, a surefire way to count live mackerel without killing them. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I'm, I'm glad that I heard you say that experience and time would be an important uh, educator. I think maybe one of the things you could do, I know this is gonna add a bit of a burden, but once you, once you look down into a bait well or a barrel and you see what the difference between 20 and 40 fish, the officer should have a pretty good reference at that point. Getting into 60, 80 or, or over, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult, but again, the fact that you're willing to uh, consider this a, a learning curve situation and I don't think there's going to be anything in particular that if it's an excessive amount, <clears throat> it also will be very evident. So um, a little bit of leniency and the learning curve at the beginning of the process would be helpful. We don't want to, <laughs> you know what I mean, we don't want to have anybody uh, suffer the consequences of having five macro over their limit mm -hmm. because they couldn't count them correctly. And I appreciate your comments, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Dad, Barrett, anything else on Atlantic Mackerel, man? I don't think I so. We're looking for a motion, right? Any further comments or questions, Mr. Chair, if you want to move for a motion? Well, let's move for a motion. Fishers, somebody make a motion, please. I need a second. And then what, a roll call? Correct. Bill Doyle, I'll make a motion. I'll second the motion. Thank you. Roll call, Jared. Bill Amaru. Aye. Bill Doyle. Aye. Suki Sawyer. Yes. Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Mike Peardnock. Mike Peardock. Want to come back to him? Shelby Edmondson. Yes. Yes, Amber Mike Peardock. Oh, Mike, what was that? Uh, I'm sorry, that's a yes. Tim Brady. Yes. I believe that's the crew, Mr. Chair. That's a unanimous vote. We can move on. Recreational to tog, slot limit, and trophy fish. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
this is an interesting one. We were contacted by the state of Rhode, Rhode Island uh, about this time last year, maybe even like early or early uh, in the new year, because uh, the way Rhode Island manages their fisheries, it's kind of a slightly different process. They actually go out and they, they ask for input from their from their stakeholders at the end of the year, and then they propose things early in the new year. And um, and they don't they have a much uh, more streamlined process, I believe, where their director um, can make uh, rule changes and get kind of approval from above about with the with the um, kind of the consensus, so to speak, of their advisory commission. But I think their rulemaking is a little less, um, you know, uh, regimented and uh, with a little less, uh, you know, formal steps than we do. Uh, so he brought this to our attention, saying that they were going to do this, adopt a uh, slot limit with a single fish uh, over like trophy size of 21 inches. I responded that uh, even if I wanted to bring this to the commission, we would never be able to get it in time because of our rulemaking process takes takes more time. So we asked that, uh, you know, we we assured them that we would consider it for the following year. So that's what we did. Uh, we went to public hearing. Um, we we got this uh the, the, the feedback was uh, very positive. Uh, and the interesting thing about Tatag uh, and how we manage it is we co-manage this species with one state, the state of Rhode Island, because the Mass Rhode Island area is considered a, a single um, stock uh, sub, uh, subunit. And, um, you know, we, we get our assess, the assessment that takes place, the stock assessment is for the Mass Rhode Island area. Our quota is established for the Mass Rhode Island area. And, um, and generally it, it just pays to, to collaborate with them. So um, in the spirit of, of sort of co-management with our neighbors uh, to the West, uh, we're proposing to uh, enact this, especially with the strong support of the anglers. Um, you know, trophy to tog fishing is, is something that's becoming more and more popular. And I just want to state that one of the reasons that Rhode Island uh, got out ahead of us on this is that they were um, sensing a lot of increased fishing effort in their waters from, from, from um, residents to the west, meeting from Connecticut and New York, because uh, the Mass Rhode Island stock, I think, is in the best shape of, of all the, of the different to tog stocks. And um, they they were concerned about increased effort resulting in um, in some stock declines. So I'm proposing that we um, adopt this measure as a complementary measure to Rhode Island, and it would create uh, uniform regs uh, for the two states. And that's especially important when you think about our Mount Hope Bay area, which you know we we do have Massachusetts waters uh, to the west that is. Um, uh, Part of the Narragansett Bay drainage, right? So, someone who's fishing in um, in in the Narragansett Bay complex might go home to a, a port like Fall River or Swansea, uh, and and so it's just whenever you can, it makes sense to have uniform regs, especially for a fish that's that's uh, concentrated in these areas. So that's our proposal: is to adopt this. So, questions for the director or Jared on this proposal. Ray, I just have one other comment that came to mind, and that is, I know our data uh, suggests that we're not going to, um, that this is li unlikely to have a huge impact on the catches, which might, some might interpret saying it, they may not have that many benefits, but I have a different view. I think that if this rule were enacted, and, and especially in, in concert with Rhode Island, that maybe in the in, in the future, over some number of years, three, five, six, seven, 10, 15 years, we might actually see these, this size fish build up in the population. And that in itself could, could create um, a, a real interesting trophy fishery, you know, for anglers. Um, and um, I don't think that we should, uh, you know, you know, minimize the potential for some real improvement in, in fishing. It just may take some time because the fish are slow growing, but I think there could be some some positive benefits going forward. And I think some of those larger fish might accrue. Thank you, Dan. Questions? Bill Amaru. Bill, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Dan, Jared, for the information that was supplied on this. I was very happy to read the comments from the industry 
uh, fishing industry, both uh, local fishermen and fishermen from a little further away from our shores who were in favor of this action. And it does make a lot of sense to me. Um, I'm no longer in the, the talk business as a commercial fisherman, nor are many, many hundreds of others who lost their permits, but can understand why there was a need to protect the, the resource as, as it uh, stands today. And this is a, a move in the right direction. And someday I'm hoping that uh, possibility of a commercial directed fishery might be available for more fishermen again in the future. So a good step in that direction. Thank you, Bill. Questions? Mike Peardnock? Michael, you recognize. Michael. Uh, thank you. Um, my, my, my comments are consistent with what you just heard. Uh, there was much, uh, many people that I reached out to or reached out to me concerning this measure. From the scuttlebuck that I heard, as well as for myself and others, many people are already implementing this conservation measure. So we're committed to uh, writing and make it a, a, you know, official is a step in the right direction. Uh, the MREP numbers from last year show a significant increase in catch by the recreational community. And such is an example of sound management of TOG and how they've come back and it's such a lucrative fishery that many people then want to fish for it from abutting states and then come into Rhode Island or nearby waters and put significant increase in effort in those areas. So some food for thought. I, I think this is positive that a, a proactive measure is being taken place as a result of those tremendous increase in recreational catch. And uh, I guess time will tell if, if such continues and we'll see where it goes in the future. But thank you for this and, and thank you. Thank you, Michael, for your comment. Any, qu any other questions or comments on this proposal? I'm not seeing any other hand raised. Thank you, Jared. Well, let's make a motion. Somebody put a motion out there. I need a second. Khalil, Thank you, Khalil. I need a second. Shelly, second. Thank you, Shelly. Roll call, Jared. Bill Amaru. Bill Amaru. Why don't you go right to Bill Doyle? Yes, I'm sorry. I, the thing wasn't working. Yes, I vote yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Mike Peardock. Yes. Sookie Sawyer. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. Unanimous vote. Thank you, Fishers. We'll move on to electronic trackers and commercial lobster and crab trap fishery. Dan. Thank you, Ray. Um, so last March, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission uh, approved an addendum that would require uh, trackers on federal federally permitted uh, lobster trap uh, vessels. And this timing of this vote was, was interesting because the at a February meeting, we pumped the brakes on it because we didn't have the support around the table. But um, we reconvened like six weeks later and approved it uh, primarily because of congressional support uh, for this. Uh, there was a, uh, there was a, an appropriation that was already in the works and it was enhanced by $4 million for the states to draw upon to uh, pay for these, for the fishermen, uh, or sp uh, basically for the device plus um, three years of service. So these are essentially uh, cell phone um, 
uh, like uh, devices. And Nick Buchan, I believe, is on today, and he's our technical guy on the on the devices. But I'm just going to talk about it first from a kind of a policy angle. Um, so in the last few years uh, since since I've been director and I've been dealing with with the offshore wind um, issues within state government and also uh, discussing um, you know some of the uh, mitigation issues uh, and the impacts with developers I can't tell you how many times I've tried to explain to everyone the deficiency uh, that that is uh, lobster data collection um, and it's uh, it's it's very challenging uh, when so many other fisheries like the scallop fishery, the groundfish fishery, the surf clam fishery, the squid trawl fishery, they all have um, uh, vessel monitoring systems uh, by federal regulation, which uh, depicts uh, tow location. So the footprint of those fisheries is very, very well defined. And for the lobster fishery, uh, it, not so much. Uh, and for a couple of reasons, um, the, the there is no federal requirement, um, at least hasn't been up till this year, to delineate, uh, I'm sorry, to, to report um, your, your activity, which is really shocking. I mean, at the state level, most states like us in New Hampshire and, and uh, Rhode Island, we do have a, a lobster reporting requirement for um, a trip level data uh, submitted at the end of the year. But um, you, what you see on the screen there is the, for Massachusetts, is the statistical areas. You can see the state areas are fairly small, but the federal areas are fairly large. So uh, we, we don't have great data. We don't have data comparable to that of the other fisheries in order to, um, I'll, I'll use the word defend, uh, if I can, the, uh, the lobster fisheries footprint, or at least to delineate it. So uh, when these folks uh, map all the data layers to try to figure out where to drop some turbines or where to, where to put a cable, um, they really have trouble um, accounting for the most important lobster uh, commercial fishery in the Northeast, uh, you know, which is lobster. Scallops is the most important uh, you know, economically to Massachusetts, but, but lobster is actually larger when you look at it on a multi-state basis. So um, we've been talking about this for the purposes of, of um, you know, better delineation for wind development. Also, it's important for the, the right whale conservation plan. Um, Bob Glenn is on the line and he can, he'll probably be talking about this later, but he could confirm that in the absence of, of good data, um, you know, the, the federal government makes assumptions about where these where these traps are. So if if you look in the far upper right hand corner of the box within the box, those are the federal statistical reporting areas. And where they don't have good data, they just smear all traps evenly throughout those zones. So it's really difficult for us to to um, to you know, do anything that's very refined, like if, if there was going to be a, a seasonal closure or not, um, it's really hard to argue to, to keep it to a minimum because there's no way to, to demonstrate just how important some pieces of bottom are to the industry. Um, so anyway, for those two reasons alone, it's, it's, uh, we're really interested in this. Now, there is an enforcement aspect of this and, you know, a lot of fishermen in the industry have, have demanded, uh, you know, enhanced lobster enforcement, especially out in the in the federal zone, because um, it's it's difficult, um, you know, for government to run the scale of vessels that would be able to go out and and haul gear, especially offshore gear, because the trawls are pretty long. Um, well, regardless, um, if you don't even know where any of the gear is, it's it's a you know, federal waters is a big area, so um, in order to to even begin to um, find uh, the resources and then uh, target those resources to places where maybe gear could be inspected, you need to know where the gear is. And so, um, especially for area three, the offshore areas, um, there's been an interest in, in doing some more um, gear inspections out there and knowing where the vessels are fishing is hugely important. And then finally, um, we all suffered through that monument uh, the monument uh, issues back in the day when um, when uh, the the federal government declared the areas um, on the a couple of, of the canyons on the southern end of Georgia's and then some of the seamounts, 
as a as a national monument and the the lobster fishery was the was the and Jonah crab fishery was the one fishery that had the, the least amount of, of of refined and accurate data because we did we really lacked this this kind of uh, precise fishing locations and when they start drawing boxes around things like seamounts you you don't stand a chance if you can't um, if you can't describe your level of activity so for all those reasons the SMFC as a group of states uh, you know support supported this I believe it was unanimous uh, to adopt this and the motion was to adopt it by the end of 2023 um, I'd like to see us try to uh, speed this up sooner I'd like to see if we could get it uh, accomplished by May 1st. And um, I'm hoping that the uh, the trade shows this uh, winter at uh, Maine Fisherman's Forum, but also at the MLA annual weekend down in Hyannis is going to give um, the, the federal permit holders, of which there's about 300 in, in Massachusetts, um, an opportunity to see these devices and and uh, and, and buy one uh, and the and the data plan. And so um, as far as a reimbursement, we're working um, to receive the monies from the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. We're looking at around um, a $1,500 award per vessel. The, the value, uh, I'm sorry, the cost of, of these devices is in the realm of like 250 to I think $400. And then the, um, the data plan for these devices is about that uh, per year. And so, um, we think that you know, an average cost of those two things, the device and the and the three years of data, would come to about twelve hundred. And we're we're interested in adding a little bit more for installation cost. So um, we are in a we're in really good shape to um, to do this. Obviously, if we don't if we don't have it together in time for May first, we could delay that. But this is a pretty simple device. You simply turn it on and then the data is being collected. It's collected continuously, even when you're out of cell phone range. And then when the vessel comes back into cell phone range, the data would be um, uploaded uh, to a server and it would be accessible to ACCSP. This data would be confidential, just like any individual fisherman's uh, catch location or catch quantity data is, is held confidential. Um, and and also oh the other another point here is that by by knowing you know more or less exact fishing location it helps in delineating uh, to the different stocks whether it be the lobster population which is um, right now there's considered two stocks georgia's bank and and the gulf of maine is considered one stock and the other southern new england is the other uh jonah crab uh, is considered a single stock, but that could change going forward. So it would really help to have good information as we develop a, a more uh, refined Jonah Crab management plan as well. Um, I think that those are all the arguments for it. Um, if, but if Bob Glenn is is, um, is available, Bob, is there any any gaps you want to fill in terms of my presentation? Um, not, not particularly, Dan, I, I think you, you, you kind of hit all the major points. I would just reiterate that um, in, in, our, in our current fisheries landscape with fixed gear fishing, especially, and, and the issues of uh, protected species, um, national monuments, and, and especially wind energy, this is going to be an a absolutely critical piece. And, you know, a, a lot of the sighting that went on in the wind energy area south of the, our islands here in Massachusetts, um, that location was chosen largely based on studying a lot of fisheries data uh, for mobile gear fishing and, re and really lacked in our ability to, to supply adequate resolution and fixed gear fishing. And I think it reflects maybe some of the siting decisions that were made. And so it's, it's our hope that having this in hand will really help us uh, moving forward at, as offshore wind development continues through, throughout Mass, Mass and Federal excuse me, federal waters off the coast of Massachusetts up in the Gulf of Maine. And so it, th this is a real vital piece of, of, of information that, that we need to really demonstrate the footprint of our, of our fixed gear fisheries and, um, and kind of make sure those interests are, are well represented. Thank you, Bob. Dan? Yeah, so Ray, um, I'll take any questions or I would ask for a motion um, if if uh, anybody wants to make one. Dan, procedurally, this doesn't require a motion. Wes, you, wanna... 
Go ahead, well, Jerry. Do you want to explain that? Sure. So this is being required um, under the director's um, authority to develop um, uh, methods and means of, of um, obtaining statistical data relevant to fisheries. Uh, and that's statutory authority does not require commission approval, uh, similar to the permitting statutory authority. Um, but uh, as stated in the memo, you know, the, the overarching purpose of this commission is to, you know, advise marine fisher, the, the marine fisheries agencies on matters pertinent to marine fisheries management. So, you know, before we do go and enact this, we, we take this opportunity for the commission to provide us with any objections or any feedback or additional items to consider before making the final decision. Thank you, Jared. Questions or comments by commission members? I got a question, Ray, or kind of comment. Okay, okay. fine, Suki, you're recognized. Yeah, uh, technical question. The optional lobster boats make 10 day trips. Is this thing going to be able to store data for 10 days worth of data? I'm not sure how often it's, you know, pinging somebody or whatever. Is it going to be able to? capacity to pull all this 10 days worth of information before they get back to shore. Hey, Nick, you can, can you weigh in on that? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. I, that's a great question and um, is actually a, something we are asking the vendors right now to confirm. Um, the applications, uh, two of them specifically that I can remember, um, one said it can hold about 20,000 pings at one minute rate, which comes to about 14 days of data. Um, we're going to confirm actually if they can go higher than that. And then another device said about six months of data. So the answer is yes, a 10 day trip should be no problem. And Nick, how many vendors and different products do you expect would be approved so that uh, a, a, a permit holder might make a decision on which device is best for them? So there's about four to five devices at this time. I, I expect four that will be approved um, immediately for our fishermen and um, that they are, three of them are satellite. I mean, th three are cellular, which means they collect their positions by a satellite from a G like your GPS, but they cache, they can make a, a mem remember the tracks and submit them later on. There is actually one satellite device that applied as well, which would give, um, I believe, real-time loca locations regardless of where they are. So the ability to remember um, locations is not necessary for that device. Thanks. So Nick, uh, question, for, uh, this is Ray Kane, uh, for transparency amongst lobstermen. You mentioned that one will track for 14 days and another device will track for up to six months. I presume when Dan ran numbers by us, he said $250 to $400. I presume the ones that maintain uh, longer data sets are the more expensive. That, that is true regarding those two devices. Um, but I would say you know, the data, it's, they're similar data plans. The initial cost is a little higher for the higher memory device, but the, the data plans long-term are similar. Thank you very much. No problem. Questions or comments? Yeah, I still got a question, Ray. Suki, you recognize. Yeah. I, you know, it's five months from now, it was May 1st. They don't even haven't decided who's going to be available. They haven't talked to the installers, I don't think. I mean, up in our area, it's a lot of probably the majority of the uh, federal permit holders. I just don't see the capacity of our electronics, local electronics dealers to install all these devices by May 1st, especially if they're not available, you know, until April type of thing. And you're then you're asking fishermen that are close, you know, they have to haul their gear out and February 1st, they're not going to be fishing those three months. The front $1,500 up front to uh, buy these things and then wait for the uh, government to uh, reimburse them in their checks. I just, I don't like, I don't like this, the feel of this. That's all. Um, well, we 
we aren't looking to reimburse the boats. We're trying to get the boats the money um, kind of in real time. So if someone has signed like a contract, uh, we'll work on this, uh, Suki. Um, if someone has has entered into an agreement with a provider, we'll be sending that name to the ASMFC and the check will be cut. So we're not asking the boats to buy it and get and get reimbursement because we're going to give out the money and and just have an expectation that they're going to buy one of these devices and we're going to make sure we give everybody enough money to cover whichever device they they're looking at um as far as the the april availability of the devices nick can see the one thing that that that's advantageous for us to go first is that we're not going to be in line with the other states <laughs> so they're going to be able to deal with the massachusetts fleet first now your mass lobsterman's weekend is at the end of march but i think the devices are going to be available prior to that nick can you speak to that yeah so in regards to each company's stock i believe the ones i spoke to have said they have the stock ready to go uh with these devices um i can't speak for them though we expect to have um the approval done by in the next two weeks and the installation, I know it sounds overwhelming um, to install a VMS device on your vessel, but such as this one in the picture, um, there is a similar device. It's simply um, a positive and negative to your 12 to 24 volt supply, similar to any electronics. And this one would sit on your dash. Um, other, There's another device that simply plugs into a USB port. I understand there would be um, it's different Vessels have different systems, but the installation is relatively simple for most of these devices. And I, I think some of the companies believe it is a self-install device, but um, I'm sure that is different for each boat. Suki, okay, thanks for that. I'm sorry, I, I must have misunderstood what comments in the past, uh, conversations in the past about the money was going to come up front or it was going to be after you installed the device. I'm sorry about that, Dan, if I missed something. No, no problem, uh, Suki. I, I'm sensitive to that. And, um, and because we're going to give everybody the same amount and let them decide which device, that's why we don't necessarily want to um, be looking at receipts. You know, like one, we're going to give everybody the same check and say, you know, here, go shopping because some guys might, you know, because time is money. And if you're, if you're installing it yourself, then we need to respect that, you know, that, that uh, your time is worth some money as well. So uh, we want to do the, the device, the data plan, plus uh, your, the time of the lobsterman or the boatyard to install. So we want to be, make sure we've given everybody enough. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah, I have one comment and uh, Suki brings up a good point. I understand Nick said that it's self-explanatory according to the companies but there are fewer and fewer electronic technicians in the Northeast. And I don't know how many permit holders are gonna be required to have this device in Massachusetts. But if Nick could make sure that the manufacturer has a hotline, so if a fisherman or a fisher does decide to install it himself, that he'll be given a hotline that he can call right from his vessel and speak to somebody at the manufacturing plant on the installation. You know, if he gets hung up with something, I would I would look for that because I think time is of the essence, as as you've said. And it would be great if uh, you know the fishers could install these in February, and March, when they're yep. not allowed to run their gear. That's yep. all. No, that's that's fair, Ray. And again, I I just want to mention that. Uh, as I deal with my uh, fellow states, um, I've informed them that we want to try to go first on this. And they're kind of standing down in terms of submitting their spending plan to the ASMFC for these funds. So we are absolutely going to be first and we're going to be first with the vendors and first with the boatyard. So I think there's about 1800 federal permit holders in total that are that, that exist that are going to re be required to have these these devices. And Massachusetts has about 300 of those. So um, we won't be standing in line, uh, you know, for with the other states, we see a similar situation with trap tags, there's only one trap tag vendor. And when all the states have the same 
uh, requirements and, and timelines for a trap tag issuance. It, there can be bottlenecks in the manufacturing and distribution end, but I'm hopeful that we won't have that because the fact that we are pushing this forward. And, and to be fair, um, Suki, uh, much like uh, we often do with other uh, like permit requirements, if the system isn't ready, you know, we can, we can, um, you know, we can issue a waiver, a temporary waiver, like, like we do if trap tags are delayed to, to vessels, if, um, if, if we run into some unexpected outcome. So the reg can be on the books, but I would, I would grant um, a, a boat who in good faith, you know, couldn't meet this deadline um, because it's, it's not, it's not do or die to get every boat on by May 1st, but believe me, the um, it's gonna pay dividends next year when we are looking back on 2023 and Massachusetts has a full set of data. And if we're gonna be arguing about a Gulf of Maine uh, wind turbine uh, placement, um, I'm gonna be in great shape and, and you guys will as well when it comes to those negotiations. So there's so many reasons to move forward with this, but you know, having 97% of the, the fleet uh, you know, with the data uh, collection is, is great. You know what I mean? Like, uh, let's not, let's not let, as we say, the perfect become the enemy of the good, but I'll work with the fleet and I'll try to be as lenient as possible, understanding the limitations. Thank you, Dan. Suki? Yeah, uh, just one more comment. A lot of guys up highway, especially, uh, uh, have VMSs because they, you know, they've been multi-species fishermen, and they some of them seem to under the impression that they uh, don't have to get this tracking device because we're already getting tracked. I think you need more uh, input with the industry, uh, the uh, the feds, or somebody needs to notify these people that they're going to have to put this device on the boat. Also, thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you, Suki. Hey, Dan. Um... One quick thing regarding the customer support that all of these vendors are going to be required to provide, you know, a call back within 24 hours. Most all of them have offered a 24 uh, seven phone number. All of them have, I believe. So there will be a support line available for installs, uh, troubleshooting, things like that. And there we're asking them to provide um, instructions specific to you know, a fisherman on how to install this, not to an electronic technician. We'll see how those look in the end, but we can work with the vendors to improve that as well. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so as I understand this, Jared, we don't need a motion. No, we don't. There's still a couple more comments though, Mr. Chair. Okay, well, you're just looking at the list, call them out. Bill Amaru. Thank you. Uh, this this will only take a second. I, I just want to say a little bit of, of what Suki mentioned concerning the ground fish industry. This, this does remind me a little of 12, 15 years ago when we had to put the VMSs on our ground fish boats. Uh, it was a little bit difficult at the beginning just to get used to the idea that this was there. But um, working with the people from the electronics companies that supplied them was very, very positive. The, the individuals they had in place to answer our questions were very helpful few little glitches at the beginning, but nothing that ever prevented us from being able to fish pretty much the way we always had. And the lobster industry is certainly not going to be burdened the way the ground fish industry is when it comes to signing in, signing out, declaring what you caught, declaring where you're going to land, <clears throat> determining whether or not you're, you're completely in uh, line with the rules and regulations like the ground fish industry still has to do. So uh, I don't know of any lobster that I've spoken with who have any issue with this at all. They expected it to happen and actually thought it should have been called for even earlier than this. So uh, I'm very much in favor of it. And I just want to see if there is any bumps along the way at the beginning that the fishermen are, are given every opportunity to explain themselves and, and to be uh, considered innocent before guilty. Thank you, Bill. Garrett? Suki, did you have an additional comment up or did I just not lower the, did we just not lower the hand? I lowered my hand according to my computer. Uh, I must have raised it again for you. My apologies. <laughs> okay. All right. We're set on this one. I don't see any more comments from the commission. We can move right. on to wealth gauge size uh, increases. Wealth gauge size scheduling.
who's taking this. Dan. Yep, I will, but Ray, thank you. I just unmuted myself. So <clears throat> this has been a um, an interesting issue for us going back uh, almost seven years now when um, you know DMF did a maturity study and found uh, some some pretty interesting and disturbing um, findings that the uh, the whelk uh, size of maturity for females was uh, much larger than the minimum size and at the same time because of heavy fishing uh, related to the decline of southern New England lobster many many vessels moved over to that and, and enhanced markets we saw a shrinking of the size composition of the adult stock. So as a conservation measure, this commission um, and, uh, approved back in 2019, a 10-year schedule of gauge increases um, going forward to reach at the end of the, of the schedule, a minimum size at which 50% of the, of the animals are sexually mature, 50% of the females, that is. And um, we've, we've experienced, I believe, uh, uh, two of those gauge increases uh, to date, uh, well on our way to, um, to, the, to reaching that size. Um, and so uh, it's been challenging for the, uh, the, the fishermen because the, uh, the, um, the, the, the size at which this, um, the size composition of the adult stock is getting smaller. They're faced with uh, a lot of uh, whelks in the trap that are either undersized or just, just at the minimum size. Uh, many traps don't have the, the benefit of escape fence uh, like our lobster uh, trap fishery does. That's something we're working on. But there's been um, some, some real concern about it because we are more aggressive in our conservation standards than some of our neighboring states. And of course, um, as far as conch or rather whelk processing, it is um, it is much, I think all of it's done in Massachusetts in, in the Northeast. I believe most of the Rhode Island catch does come into, into New Bedford for processing. So um, we've been petitioned by uh, a group called the Massachusetts Conch uh, Fishermen's Association. And they have been supported by their legislative uh, delegations in the New Bedford area and have asked us uh, to uh, make a minor change to this where instead of going up on the minimum size every two years to go up on the minimum size every third year. Uh, there is also an interest in um, doing some population studies. There are some concerns and, and some of our commission members have expressed this that that um, concern that in the end, you know, in our in our grand strategy, which at this point is scheduled to be completed by 2029. Uh, if we, uh, wondering if, if we are gonna have an exclusively female fishery based on the growth rates uh, and, and, the, uh, and, the, and the sizes uh, of, of size of maturity. So uh, that is something that's worth investigating. Uh, I think the theme of this is, can we extend it? You know, if we're staying the course at this time, but can we, uh, slow it down a little bit uh, by 50% so, uh, in the event that there's some uh, new science that might come forward to uh, make us uh, maybe choose a different route, you know, whether it's, you know, catch controls or quotas or, or something else that might be more, um, for lack of a better word, sustainable. Um, so anyway, um, in the interest of, of uh, making this a... Uh, uh, a balanced approach uh, in the interest of satisfying the, uh, the petitioners and their advocates, um, I'm proposing to you that we, uh, we adopt what was requested, which is a one, an extra year between gauge increases, which would translate into the next gauge increase taking place in um, 2024, instead of kicking in next year in 2023. And so I'll just, also mentioned for those of you who aren't up on whelk management, the the animal is is not necessarily symmetrical, so it could be difficult to to get an exact measurement on a non-symmetrical animal. And so, as a result, uh, what we do is we we regulate the minimum size by use of a gauge. And if you can pull the animal uh, with the operculum down, if you can pull it through it in any orientation, 
then it would be considered sublegal. So we actually re, uh, we're regulating the gauge, not necessarily the minimum size, but there is a strong correlation between what animals are going to be considered legal and sublegal based on the gauge. So at this point, uh, we still don't have uh, any uh, any of the uh, the whelks that are mature at the current minimum size, but that doesn't mean there aren't any minimum uh, I mean, any spawners because you know not every whelk is is uh, is being harvested. Um, you know there is there are some that uh, that do uh, avoid the fishery and, and are spawning for sure because we're obviously seeing uh, small whelk uh, in the population, but uh, we're we're still kind of struggling with trying to develop a long-term conservation strategy for the species. And I would just comment that this is a really unique species jurisdiction wise, because it is not a species that is controlled by the municipalities like other shellfish. It is not a species that is governed by an interstate management plan like, AS, like our ASMF species. And it's not a species that has the federal government involved with Magnuson. So it's us, it's, it's DMF, it's the commission and it's the stakeholders and there's no recreational fishery. So, you know, we've got about, um, I don't know, 74 guys who are making a living on this, uh, you know, either, a, you know, full time or, or, or as a primary income or as, as a part of their portfolio. And, you know, we're trying to do, uh, you know, what's best for the species and, and, and it's what's best for the, the economics of this fishery at the same time. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a struggle. So, but I, I do recommend that we, uh, we, we uh, satisfy the petitioners with a consistent one year delay going to every third year. So I'll take any questions. Questions or comments for Dan? Jared? I'm not you? seeing any hands raised. Oh, Shelly? Dr. Evanson, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, it's not, not really a question, just a comment. I just wanted to say, um, you know, this fishery and um, species remains to be a little bit of a mystery in my mind on how to best regulate it sustainably. Um, I think this pause is a good one. And I hope that we can think through some maybe studies that will help us understand what's happening. Um, I realize that this pause delays the schedule um, and it, you know, delays the time and, and no females are currently being protected. But I also worry at the end goal of the of the gauge increase in 2029, what that will um, leave the fishery and the industry. So um, anyway, I just wanted to thank um, Director McKernan for this pause and I hope we can come up with some um, studies to get more information on what's happening with this um, elusive creature. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evanson. I, I, I have a comment. Uh, we, we've been studying this for years. Uh, I know we finally agreed to a management plan back in 19, I believe you said, Dan, but prior to that, we had meetings on the Cape. And I, I think it's, it, it's imperative that we do a lot more research. I guess SPAS might be involved now because I'm hearing from so many fishermen about all the small conch and it's almost spatial. So I think a lot more research has to go into this industry. It is affecting 74 harvesters. And I don't know what the time schedule is, if DMF is gonna be doing any research, if Steve Wilcox is, SMAS, Dr. Edmondson, I know is doing a, a project right now, but you, you know, this this keeps coming back to haunt us, this management. Right. Well, it keeps coming back to haunt us because they can't go to Mike Pentney or Bob Beal <laughs> right. or to the constables because it's us, right? So that's why. But but Ray, those are good questions. Um, we're interested in in maybe getting uh, SMAS uh, more involved in the future on this. They are actually doing some uh, additional aging work uh, right now. They've been working on it this year. And uh, there is a, um, a, what do you call it, a study fleet uh, project that's going on between Rhode Island and Mass. I know that Shelley was involved with some of that in the, in the, at the beginning. I'm not sure COVID might have delayed that a little bit, but there is an ASMFC or maybe it's an SK grant. I'm not sure which um, 
that uh, that is trying to look at the fishery performance relative to uh, what's being caught, what's being discarded. Uh, I don't think they're necessarily going to be, you know, examining um, uh, section maturity stage uh, per se, but uh, looking at fishery performance of a couple of Massachusetts vessels and a couple of Rhode Island vessels. Uh, as far as Steve Wilcox goes, um, he has sailed. <laughs> he's now ahead of the uh, resource assessment survey, so he's not available to us uh, any longer to, to focus. He's, he did some great work for us while working for Bob. He did his master's thesis, uh, and that's that's uh, how we got most of the data that we've 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 uh, enjoyed having was by virtue of his master's work. But um, uh, we're, we're interested in, in having the SMAS folks help us out, especially given the um, the level of confidence that uh, that some of the legislators uh, seem to have in SMAS. Uh, this is a tough one. So if they can help us out, we'd be, we'll take all the help we can get on that one. Thank you, Dan. Uh, one other comment, if you could be and how it does affect 74 harvesters, inshore fishermen, and they constantly question, you know, or what are you doing? Can you keep us updated on any new research or, or, you know, new, yeah, new research that's ongoing so we can at least answer the harvesters, you know, have an answer for them? If certainly. Keep us yep. updated, I, I'd certainly appreciate it. I'm sure Dr. Edmondson would and any other commission member who deals with conch fishermen. Yep. Conch message, fishermen. message received. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Any other comments or questions? Bill Amaru? Yes, you thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. At the risk of uh, sounding like a broken record, I'm going to say uh, and put my weight behind everything you just said, Ray. Everything, including the fact that our region here on the Outer Cape uh, in the corner represents a substantial portion of the fleet. We've, we've gotten comments back from virtually every one of the harvesters in our region, and they were thoughtful. They were all in favor of this action. But to, to, a, to, a, to a fisherman, every one of them said, we need more information about this species because we just simply are, are operating blind and we can't keep be, uh, doing it and expect a, a reasonable success with our actions. Um, I'm, I'm going to say the same thing Ray just did. We need to have information that we can convey back to the fleets as they ask us these questions and we, we stand there with our palms up, unable to give them more information. And uh, if there's anything that we can do as commissioners to solicit additional efforts on the part of the fleets to become part of a study, um, let us know because these fishermen have got the information that they, they deal with the animals every day that they go out. And uh, I'd love to see them brought into it in a little bit closer level. And then if you've lost a, a key player, uh, uh, as you just mentioned, the individual who was doing the work before Wilcox, it, it, we have to bring someone in to take his place and put someone in the lead position so that this has direction and not just a kind of an open ended uh, discussion. Um, those are my comments. And, and again, I'm very much in favor of this action. Thank you. Thank you, William. Any other comments, Jared? I'm not seeing any other hands raised, Mr. Chair. Uh, this does require a uh, motion and a vote by the commission. All right. Fishers, I need a motion, I need a second, and then a roll call vote. I'll move the motion. That's Bill Amaro moving the motion. Thank you, Will. Tim Brady, second. second. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Well, tell you, we, Tim. We, we got a second and a third. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Evans. Roll call vote, Jared. Bill Amaro. Yes. Bill Doyle. Bill Doyle. Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Mike Peerdock. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Suki Sawyer. Yes. And Bill, Bill Doyle. Doyle. Yes. Yes. All right. Mr. Chair, motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, members. We'll move on. Protected species management. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is Bob Harlan speaking, and uh, thank you, everybody, 
uh, for all commissioners for attending this morning. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in here, and this is actually, I believe, Dan's. I thought this was an update. This is actually the management. So, Dan, do you do you want me to yeah. take this? I I could take it because uh, I think when you start with your overarching stuff, it, you, it's going to be much more detailed. I can get through this one pretty quick, though, Bob. Yeah, um, so this is kind of a I was a little bit of an oversight, but when we enacted the regulations on. Uh, our our ability to uh, uh, extend first of all to extend the closure and to create directors um, kind of discretionary authority to to uh, to open early or extend uh, we failed to include the recreational fishery and so um, you know that can get very awkward for example if uh, right now under the rules if the uh, closure uh, is scheduled to lift on May fifteenth but whales have, have left in late April, we can open that fishery uh, to the commercial fishermen, but we can't uh, give the recreationals the same uh, advantage. Alternatively, if the, if the whales were to stay beyond May 15th, we could extend the closure a little bit longer, either in all of the area of Massachusetts waters or a sub area, but we, don't, we didn't give ourselves that same authority to prevent the recreational fishermen from fishing. So it's really just to uh, give us that authority to, uh, to put the, or, or to take the same actions for the recreational pot fishermen as we do the commercial. Jared, do you wanna fill in any gaps there? No, that, that covers okay. uh, the reason for this pretty succinctly. Yep, thanks. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, we could. This will require a motion. We can take comments and then and then move to the motion. Uh, Questions or comments? Suki. Suki, you recognize. I was waiting to make a motion. That's all. I'm not seeing any comments. So, Suki, if you want to make that motion, I'll make this motion. Accept this. Need a second. Second, Khalil. Thank you both. Thank you, Suki. Thank you, Khalil. Jared, roll call vote. Bill Amaru. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Suki Sawyer. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Mike Pierdock. Yes. Motion passes unanimously, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commission members. Thank you, Jared. Moving on, extended area 1A, winter mobile gear. Actually, no, Ray, if we, there's two other aspects of this that we, we need to cover uh, under protected species. Sorry about that. Um, and Bob, I might, I, I might let you take this one since uh, you're uh, totally engaged in the kind of the deliberations of the take reduction team and the federal rules. Do you want to talk about the rescission of the 600 pound weak link and then follow up with the protected species housekeeping you and Jared on the definitions of the buoy line? Yeah, I'd be happy to, Dan. Thanks. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, so this particular um, recommendation is so that the Commonwealth will kind of come in line with a rule that NOAA fisheries rescinded in 2021. So in 2021, NOAA Fisheries did away with the requirement to fish a 600 pound weak link at the buoy. Um, the, the initial um, thought behind the effectiveness was that in, in the case of an entanglement, uh, right whale entanglement, that the buoy line would slide through the bay lean uh, of the whale. And when it got to the terminus where this 600 pound swivel was that it, it would break and allow the whale to, to swim free. That was the original idea behind this rule when it went into place. Um, ultimately, uh, what we found or what NOAA Fisheries has found through examining the entanglement record is we, we don't tend to see whales get entangled in this ma manner with the buoy stuck right at the baleen. Um, the baleen tends to act as almost like a, a jam cleat whereby the, 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 the rope gets kind of cleated off in the baleen kind of somewhere in the, in the midsection of the rope. And as a result of the, the questionable effectiveness of this, NOAA Fisheries rescinded this rule back in 2021. At the time, we were also conducting rulemaking, but we did not uh, rescind this because we're in a little bit of a different uh, situation in Massachusetts, whereby uh, we were no longer part of the, the Northeast uh, lobster 
trap pot fishery. Um, as you all are aware, we were named our own separate fishery on the MMPA list of fisheries as the Mass Massachusetts Mixed Species Trap Pot Fishery, which includes our lobster fishery, our whelk fishery, and our, and our fish pot fishery. And we were kind of in a, in a in no man's land whereby NOAA fisheries only rescinded this requirement for the lobster pot fishery, but did not do so for their other fisheries. And so technically there would have been, it would have been a requirement to maintain that. And so um, with this rule, essentially, we're just um, trying to bring us in, back into phase with the federal rules um, and not require this. Uh, we did, you know, we had substantial feedback uh, on this at, at the public hearings or some feedback on it. And by and large, there's still support for uh, for the industry to use this. There's a lot of fishermen who, who like it. They like the swivel. It cuts down on line twist. Um, and they feel like that, you know, it, it provides an extra what if measure. Um, but I get, but even if we rescind this rule, fishermen are still allowed to use it. There's no rules against using it. And so that practice could still continue. Um, so that, that's pretty much a, a summary of this. Um, I, you know, Jared, is there anything that I'm missing here, particularly that that's, or does that cover pretty well? Uh, that covers it pretty well. Uh, the one thing I would add is that this does uh, remain in place for the recreational fishery um, because they don't have any of the other um, buoy line um, modification regulations in place, such as the, the weak inserts Correct. that are required in the commercial fishery. Um, so this would just apply to the commercial fishery and not the recreational fishery. Uh, quick question, Matt Bass. If if the, this contrivance kind of thing doesn't work, does it make any sense to continue to require it for recreational fishermen? It, um, if, if it's not working, it just seems one more thing to, to kind of jams people up. But maybe something for just a future thought. Yeah, thanks. I mean, uh, our thought with maintaining it is that, so the difficulty in this is that what we do know is a lot of times, uh, you know, as you know, you're well aware, um, Lieutenant Bass, is that, uh, you know, out in the ocean, fishermen routinely lose their buoys. Um, and so that, and that, so that link is gone and the buoy is gone. And so it's difficult to, this is a type of implementation or, or regulation that's tough to prove that it is working. If it successfully worked, you would just find a, a buoy line with nothing on the end. You wouldn't know of a, of a boat ripped that off, or uh, someone else ran gear over it and it got popped off, and or a whale hit it. So it's a little bit difficult. So, given that uh, we're just trying to be overly cautious, I think, with our wreck fishery, given that um, we don't require those other measures because of the the, the necessary expertise at, at rigging to to achieve them. That, that this is at least maybe some stopgap that may provide some layer of protection, albeit very difficult for us to, to actually quantify. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So I guess I would, is there other, any interest? I mean, I mean that's, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know how the other commission members feel about maintaining this on the rec sector is there any other comments no i'm not seeing any comments on that okay i got i got a comment up dan sorry go ahead suki uh, i just want to back what bob said uh i think it's gonna be a lot more failures of the wink uh the weak link rope uh because of this because they don't seem to been at the same ratios on the tension as the other ropes do. So I think we're going to see a lot more failure in the weak rope. That's all. Thanks. And yeah, so Suki, are you recommending just for like, uh, for, for safety or for, for um, operational considerations that the fleet keep it, even if it's not, uh, a, a requirement is that something that that i mean lobstermen know best how how gear works sometimes better than the right obviously better than the rec sector 
Is that something you'd recommend people keep? No, I wouldn't uh, want to make everybody do something they didn't need to do. I'm just making a general comment like mm -hmm. Bob did that probably going to see the guy's going to see a lot more twisted up rope if they don't keep using swivels, but I'm not, yeah, you know, advocating for them to have to buy per swivels just for that reason. It's up to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's consistent with a lot of what we heard at, at a uh, public hearing uh, from the industry is that, you know, there are practical uh, benefits to continuing to use them. Um, but, you know, as, as we said in the memo, you know, it's probably not, you know, the practical benefits are probably not sufficient to maintaining the, the mandate to use them. Uh, Shelly? Just was wondering, should we, I'm just confused why it would still be required in the recreational fishery and would we want to extend the recommendation to rescind the requirement for the, the rec fishery as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to, I mean, that was Matt Bass's kind of indirect recommendation, right, Matt? Is that what you're suggesting for consistency? Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm just, sometimes it's a struggle for um, for rec people to comply with that and then to give them a citation or, or whatnot or make corrective action for that is kind of maybe time consuming. And then I'm just thinking ahead in court where somebody might say, hey, this has been rescinded on the commercial side because they say it doesn't work. Why do I have to do it? Yeah. Bob, how important is this to keep for the on the rec sector, even if we recommended they keep it for operational reasons? Yeah, I mean, from a conservation perspective or relative a, a, to a legal perspective, relative to satisfying any federal um, protective species management mandates, I, I don't think it's that important, Dan, for the rec sector. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, the rules under the MMPA don't apply to the rec sector. In Massachusetts, we manage our, our rec sector to try to be as consistent with those rules as, as practicable uh, and possible. And so, um, you know, this I think this is one that could go either way. Yeah. So, Bob, uh, professionally, you wouldn't um, you wouldn't try to talk me out of extending this to the rec sector if if commission if I wanted to resubmit this. No, absolutely not, Dan. I, okay. I, I, I don't think it's a, a, a critical thing. I, mm -hmm. um, I think, but you know, if it's, if it's, if Lieutenant Bass is indicating that this is something that wreck fishermen already have difficulties complying with, um, it, it's certainly maintaining it uh, when we, we, I can't point to any clear conservation benefit that's backed by any data, I, I think is, is, is kind of untenable. So I, I, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. Is there any objection from the commission if I uh, alter the director's recommendation here to uh, include recreational uh, trap permit holders as well? No. Okay. I'm not seeing any objections. All right. So the the so who who made the motion? Is it? Do we have a motion yet? We do not have a motion. Okay. So why don't we? Um, whoever makes the motion can read that recommendation and and maybe. Uh, uh, to include, okay, no, I'm sorry. I, I'll make, I'll, I'll resubmit the recommendation to the full commission. This would be to rescind the requirement that commercial and recreational trap fishers install the 600 pound weak link where the buoy line connects to the buoy. And now the commission can uh, vote to um, uh, approve that with a second, or I'd make a motion to approve it with a second and then the, the full commission can vote on this I'll amended move. recommendation. Move the motion. Khalil. Thank you, Khalil. Jared, roll call. We need, we need a second. I'll second, I'll second, second that. <laughs> yeah. Julie, yeah, that was it. either Bill Doyle or Shelley, depending on who you want to. Well, give it to Shelley because she made the, uh, she brought it up. So. Okay. <laughs> Bill Amaru. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Sookie Sawyer. Yes. Shelley Edmondson. Yes. Tim Brady? Yes. Mike Pierre-Knock? Yes. Motion passes are unanimously. Thank you, members. Thank you, Jared. So you have something else to discuss here? There's, there's one more item on protected species housekeeping. 
And, Thank you, yeah, Bob, Bob and Jared have at it. Bob, you can you can open up. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, start off and Jared uh, can uh, can fill in. So um, especially in, in, in Massachusetts, we have a, a couple of regulations um, relating to buoy lines that, that indicate uh, you know a percentage of the buoy line that can be float rope or a or um, including like the when we talk about uh, setting up a buoy line, fish, fishers are allowed to have a a percentage of float rope at the bottom, which I believe is is the bottom one third, can be composed of of float rope um, um, to get that kind of that that lower section off the bottom, so it doesn't entangle. Another rule would be uh, our weak weak link insert um, rules, or weak insert rules, um, and gear marking rules. Uh, are required in the top 75% of the buoy line. And um, one of the, the issues associated with this that we found over the last uh, year when we were doing kind of gear haul out and inspection during the closure last year was that um, there's kind of a broad array of gear configurations on how um, fishers connect their buoy lines to the ground lines. Um, and it's as it seemingly it would be very, in most cases, uh, it's very easy to d differentiate between where the buoy line starts and where the ground line starts. Uh, but that wasn't universal. And we found, you know, a fair number of fishers who uh, it was very difficult to determine exactly where that was um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and as a result, it made um, monitoring compliance and, and enforcing uh, rules relating to those two rules and the percentages that we allow, like where the marks have to start and when, when or where the, the buoy lines have to start, it made it fairly difficult. And so um, with this proposed rule, what we're trying to achieve is a, a standard that you know all fishers are aware of that this is the point at which we're going to start to, you know, we're gonna consider the ground line ends and the buoy line starts. And, and that's the p p position from which we'll determine, you know, compliance with those percentages, the 75% uh, relative to gear marking and weak inserts and the, the one third relative to how much float rope you can have. Um, and so with this, in this proposal, um, Jared and I are recommending kind of a, a standard metric of 12 feet in front of the terminal trap on each end. Um, and that's the point at which we would consider where the buoy line starts. Um, if the fishing, fishermen understand that, they can, uh, you know, rig their gear from that point, knowing that, you know, after 12 feet, that's where we're going to measure. Um, and, and uh, you know, that's kind of the main, um, the main, you know, this is something that we found as a result of kind of in the field looking at this and and seeing inconsistencies and in, in how how rigging was going. And so, as a result of that, we wanted to provide a consistent metric so that both uh, fishermen can easily comply with the rule and and uh, you know a law enforcement can easily interpret enforcement of those rules. Yeah, I, I'd add the one piece for clarification is that that twelve feet applies when it's not readily apparent where that connection between the ground line and the buoy line begins. So in, we, as Bob was saying, that we encounter a good amount of Frankenstein gear where, you know, you really couldn't, you know, determine where that ground line connected to the buoy line because, you know, there were multiple shots and, and, and splices of, of line that, 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 that you know, configured together towards the terminus of the buoy line. Uh, so in those instances, rather than trying to figure out where that connection actually exists, we're just going to go to the trap and say 12 feet in front of the trap, that's the beginning of the buoy line. On all other cases where that connection is crystal clear, as it was on most of the gear we observed, we, it's, it's where that connection exists. So, so that 12 foot um, standard only going to be applied to the um, to these you know so-called Frankenstein gear. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Jared. Soupy, have you got any comment on this? 
Um, no, I think I'm all set with it, Ray. Thanks. Are you good with this, Suki? That's that's my question. I mean, you're a professional lobster. Man. Yeah, I, it's pretty straightforward for the state water. So uh, there was always been a discussion about because we, you know, we can't use everybody. Most guys using seven sixteens ground line now, and they want to know where it could end on your buoy line. So obviously, guys want it to be farther up the buoy line, but I don't think anybody's got any real problems with having it just twelve feet. Thanks. Thank you, Soupy. So what are we doing here, Jared? Motion. Uh, is there any more discussion on this from other members? I don't see any hands raised. We need a motion. I'll make the motion, Ray. Thank you, Soupy. I need a second. I'll second. Thank you, Bill. Roll call vote, Jared. Bill Amaru. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Will Bogdan. Yes. Stucky Sawyer. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Mike Pierknock. Yes. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, members. All right. Mr. Chair, I'm going to take this one to give to, to give Dan a Dan a break uh, on his voice. Uh, this is our recommendation on mobile gear area 1A. Um, uh, this came as a uh, as a request of uh, Lou Williams uh, to extend the area 1A seasonal closure um, into the spring to allow additional access to the sea scalp resource. So area 1A is that green area off Gloucester and Rockport that's historically been open to mobile gear fishing um, seasonally, um, whereas that broader pink area um, is, is closed um, year round under the North Shore mobile gear closure area. Uh, it's seasonally open February 1 to March 31, and then again in like June 15th to September 30th. Uh, that seasonal winter time opening, um, you know, tried to accommodate some mobile gear fishing in that area um, at, at a time where there would be a diminished um, user group conflicts with the, um, with the fixed gear fishery, um, given the fixed gear fishery is now subject to a seasonal uh, right whale closure, extending fishing opportunities in there into April and May when that closure is in effect. Uh, likely won't enhance uh, user group conflicts. Um, we expect that most of the fishing that's going to be occurring in this area during this, um, you know, April 1 to May 15th extension of its uh, seasonal opening will be uh, sea skull dredge fishing. Uh, we do not anticipate that there's going to be a uh, a lot of direct or indirect groundfish fishing effort in that area, given the seasonal availability of groundfish species, as well as the variety of overarching closures, such as the April 15th, April 30th groundfish closure in the Gulf of Maine in state waters, and um, that goes up to the New Hampshire border, as well as the May closure in state waters that goes up to the New Hampshire border. Um, uh, I, I suppose trawls could be fished during that uh, early April period, but we don't see much trawling activity in the adjacent March period when it's allowed. Um, there could potentially be some flatfish bycatch um, in sea skull dredges, but we think it's probably going to be nominal given our analysis of federal observer data for adjacent uh, federal waters, uh, which shows that the bycatch of uh, winter flounder, which is probably the species most typically to co-occur with the sea skull dredge fishery in that area, um, it, it is nominal. Um, but that's something that we'll continue to, to monitor. Um, and we expect that there's probably going to be some improved uh, data collection um, at the federal level on uh, sea skull dredge bycatch in the northern Gulf of Maine fishery all over the next few years which will um, you know, help our, us further inform that analysis. Uh, we don't expect there's gonna be much around fish bycatch, cod, or haddock in sea skull dredges given the uh, 10 inch twine top mesh size. So um, 
that's our recommendation is to extend this through May 15th, which with corresponds with the regulatorily set end date of the uh, trap gear closure. Um, so I'll take any questions or comments. Questions or comments? Suki? Yeah, thanks, Jared. Uh, just, we talked about this before and uh, if Dan was to open it up before May 15th, uh, this would be closed down, but you don't really seem to put this in the recommendation here anywhere. I think that needs to be clarified. Dan, would you want to make this the, the May to May 15 period of this contingent upon the um, status of the lobster fishery? Yeah, that's reasonable. Is that an amendment that we can make on the fly? If, if that's where you want to go. Yeah. Suki, is that something that you're suggesting we do? Yeah. Yeah. Have it on the condition of when you open the, uh, you know, yeah. when the right whales are gone. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, that's, that's fair. Um, yeah. That, that language can live on, especially, um, you know, as we get into uh, you know, like new new iterations of the whale plan, who knows where it's going to go? So, yep, I, I think we can we can make a recommendation to uh, to amend this to allow the director to uh, close the area. Uh, you know, coincident with the opening of the lobster fishery. So, if just, just for my edification in in drafting a final rule on this this would be that the fish that this open season exemption would occur from february 1 to may 15th unless sooner closed by the director um in response to um the opening of the trap gear fishery yes okay I'll make that motion, Jared, if nobody else wants to comment. Thank you, Suki. For the I'm comment. not seeing any other uh, comments, Mr. Chair. So, um, Suki's motion. You have uh, a second? Bill Amory, is this a uh, hand up for a second or a comment? Yeah, I, <clears throat> my comment would be I wish Lou Williams could comment on that recommendation. <laughs> Um, if my, my recollection is, and I can confirm this in the prior minutes from uh, when this was initially raised back in the August or September, but, but Lou was supportive when, when Sookie had uh, raised that um, at that meeting. Okay. That just, that just I'm, failed I'm, to make this recommendation. Yeah. All right. I'm glad to hear that. That's all. He isn't here to speak for himself, but if he's already commented or not, I'll take that. Yeah, that that's my recollection, and I can I can work to confirm that right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Any other comments? Ray, do we have a second on the motion? No, not yet, Dan. Okay. So there's no further comments. We'll move Sookie's motion and look for a second. I don't see I'll it. second that. All right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Move to roll call vote. Bill Amaru? Yes. Bill Doyle? Yes. Khalil Bogdan? Yes. Suki Sawyer? Yes. Shelly Edmondson? Yes. Tim Brady? Yes. Mike Piernock? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, members. Thank you, Jared. Moving on, prohibition on retention and landing of short fin mako. Yeah, Raymond, um, this is pretty straightforward. ASMFC uh, voted the, uh, as a compliance measure that <clears throat> all states to take actions to um, adopt the, the standard to, um, uh, to prohibit uh, short fin mako uh, take in state waters um, as, as a means to support the HMS highly migratory uh, species management by NOAA fisheries. Um, we have very little short fin mako in, in state waters. I think this just gives our law enforcement uh, officers a, another tool because they could also write the vessel up for a state violation and not have to go a federal case against the individuals um, should should there be a, a federal prohibition. Um, 
Jared, any follow up or Nicola? Um, I think you you worked on this one as well. I don't have any follow up, Deb, but no. I defer to Nicola. Yeah. No, I think you've covered it well. It, okay. it is also currently um, prohibited in federal waters, um, but NOAA did adopt a process by which they could allow some federal waters harvest in the future when ICAT allows it. But we would maintain the, the zero possession for state waters. All right. Thank you, Nicola. So we need a motion or are there more comments? If there's any discussion and then move to a motion. So any hands right. for discussion? Not seeing any comments, so we can move Let's to a motion. Move to a motion, please. I need a motion and a second. I'll make Mike motion. Here, not motion to approve. Thank you, Shelly. And Michael, you're seconding? Yes. Thank you. Jared, roll okay. call. Bill Amaru. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Leo Bogdan. Yes. Sookie Sawyer. Sookie Sawyer. Shelly yes. Edmonds. Oh. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Mike Pierrenock. Yes. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. We're on to the last action item today. Thank you, members. Thank you, Jared. Moving on to housekeeping. Yeah. Jared, this I, one's all yours. Be brief. Yeah, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. Uh, it's a housekeeping measure. It's, it's basically uh, six points. We're go, uh, one is to eliminate the term grandfather, assisted with regulatory um, executive mandates. Um, that um, term's history goes back to uh, disenfranchisement of voter, voters, um, and, and they've, they've requested we remove that term from our code. Uh, similarly, uh, remove, uh, replace um, gender terms with gender neutral terms. So, you know, things like replacing the term uh, fishermen with fishers. Um, there's a section of our regulation, you can see MR 8.08, that has, you know, redundant, outdated provisions that just historically weren't rescinded when other um, regulatory sections were moved around. Uh, and an effort to clean this up, continuing effort to clean up the code. Um, we're moving to eliminate those. Uh, we're going to correct some typographical, it says topographical errors, but let's just say typographical errors in the regulatory language defining black sea bass spots and mobile gear exemptions. Uh, that's a remnant of the Secretary of State um, sometimes mispublishing fractions. Um, we're going to move buoy line marking rules from uh, section four to section 12. That moves them from the um, fishing equipment section to the protected species section, which is uh, more germane to what they do. And then the last aspect of this is uh, we're going to kind of update the organization of the protected species section at 12, um, including a couple amendments to the purpose section that better reflect the status of the state's current protected species management program. Um, so those are the housekeeping changes we're proposing today. I could take any questions or comments should you have them. Uh, if not, this does require a motion and a vote. Questions or comments? I'm not seeing any questions or comments, Mr. Chair. Need a motion and a second. I make the motion. Bill Thank Amaru. You. Thank Tim you, Brady, Bill. second. Thank you, Tim. Garrett, roll call vote. Bill Amaru. Yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Cleo Bogdan. Yes. Suki Sawyer. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. Tim Brady. Yes. Mike Pierrenock. Yes. All right, that motion passes unanimously, Mr. Chair, it concludes the action item section today. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna need a couple minutes to pivot and bring up um, the other presentations if you want to take the opportunity for a break yes please 10 minute break thank you mr chair resume at 11 10 10 i got 11 4 now you want all to right 11 15 then okay very good thank you we're back mr chair 
Well, good morning once again, members. We're back in session and we're going to move on to discussion items. Interstate fisheries management update. Ray, uh, Nicola Meserve is going to um, cover this. Thank you, Dan. Nicola, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so this update on ASMC actions um, is going to cover some outcomes from the annual meeting um, earlier this month and do a quick preview of um, a one day joint meeting that the Commission will be having with the Mid-Atlantic Council um, next month. Um, and we're actually going to start out with striped bass, which uh, Dr. Armstrong will cover for us. Um, last meeting, we, we kind of previewed the stock assessment results, but um, Mike wasn't here. And so we wanted to provide an opportunity for him to speak to it and, and allow for any questions about the, the striped bass stock assessment. Michael, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, well, I, I can provide some, some good news coming from uh, the assessment. Uh, it's tempered a bit by uh, some other news that's going on, but I'll talk about that. Um, so you did see this, I, I think, uh, last time, but I wanted to go over it again because it is it's really significant. Um, the assessment shows we have ended overfishing, which is uh, fishing mortality being too high. And that would be on the, the bottom chart on the right. You can see that red line is a number we need to be below. And ideally we are below the dotted line. Um, and so you can see by the last two years, we are below that. Um, we were at an F of about point. 137.14, say, and that's a little bit, um, as you can see below the target, which is 0 0.2. That's great news because that is the only way to cover and grow the stock. Um, and it's also testimony to the good work that the board has done, that you folks have done, that anglers have done. Um, everyone should take a little pat on the back because as you know, we took a 25% cut a few years ago. We took 18% cut a couple of years ago and it's actually worked. So that's good news. Um, I will add caution <laughs> in everything we do is that landings were up a lot so far this year. So we'll see what happens to F. For SSB, um, you can see we are actually turning up in the last four years, which is good. We, we bottomed out about four years ago. We have the 2015 year class hitting the uh, spawning stock biomass, and that's helping it increase. And the projections show if we stay at the F we are now or stay below the target, that we will be recovered up to the dotted line by 2029. Um, that is a, that's a, you know, that's, assuming we keep mortality low, which has always been a huge challenge. We've, we've never been able to keep it low in the last uh, 20 years. So hopefully um, we can do that. Um, so the good news is we don't have to do anything. We can rest on our laurels and pat ourselves on the back for a brief period of time. Um, the problem is a couple of things. One, there is a retrospective pattern in the um, the assessment, it's not bad, but we probably overestimated SSB a little bit and underestimated F. So that's what we're going to have to look at, and we'll examine all the data at the end of this year and see how we're doing. We're not planned to do another assessment for two years. Um, at the meeting, I pushed for next year. I really would like to track. Um, didn't get a great reception, but we'll see. Um, the other thing, which is very daunting, that's coming along, it's not a, we don't have a chart here, but the last four years of recruitment from Chesapeake Bay have been, for lack of a better term, dismal. Dave, it's been really low. So we, 2015 was great, 2016 was, uh, I think, lousy, 1718 average and then 19, 20, 21, and unfortunately this year 22 
have been close to the time series low. We're hoping this isn't a paradigm shift that Chesapeake Bay is, is feeling the effects of climate change uh, because I, I think I've told you uh, many times that recruitment is environmentally induced in striped bass. And it has to do with the fresh water flow, the temperature, and setting up conditions. Um, when they're right, you get a huge year class. When they're wrong, you get poor ones. So something has happened in the last four years. Um, we do have plenty of SSB. The amount of SSB, which is producing the young, has produced some of the biggest year classes we've ever seen. So it's not an SSB problem. It's something in the bay. The Hudson and Delaware indices, which supply smaller parts of our stock, um, have not shown that terrible decline. Um, so we're hopeful for that too, that'll support us. So stay tuned because um, when those four year classes start recruiting into SSB, it is gonna be very hard to keep um, the SSB from declining unless we have a very, very low F. Um, so I think, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, good news for now, caution as we go ahead. So uh, happy to take any questions. Questions for Dr. Armstrong. Khalil. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Mike, that was, um, looks uh, up, you know, cautiously optimistic. You made a statement that says, um, Things will look good, uh, and, and I'm kind of paraphrasing because I, I didn't get it all down. Things will look good if we can keep the mortality low. Uh, can you explain that or kind of enlighten us as to what that statement means? Yeah, so the, the projections that show us hitting um, the SSB target by 2029 are predicated on us keeping below the target F. Um, which is just below 0.2. So if if we go above that, um, all bets are off. The projection is is meaningless, um, depending on how much we we go above it. So if if we go above it, um, won't we're not projected to be hit the SSB till after 2029, and it depends on how severely we we uh, we go above it. Once, that, once, I'm sorry, I cut you off. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 I was just going to say, does that answer your question? Yeah, yes, it does. Uh, I'm looking looking at this thing long term. You're going to 2029. Once that 2015 class, which was a strong class, and that's where the uh, spawning biomass is right now. What is the what is what are the thoughts that once once again, if, if we're taking fish. And we're taking fish and we don't have the recruitment coming up. What are, what are the thoughts about um, what the fishery might look like once that 2015 class has been fished out, whether by recreational or by commercial? Yeah, I, and, and they won't be fished out, but they will decline from natural and, and fishing mortality. Um, so they're 2015, it's, there's seven. Um, so they're barely into the slot and barely into the SSB. So a lot of the growth we see in the projections is probably this year class. Um, after it are some fairly average ones and that's okay because um, that'll prop up the recovery too. And it's not till we hit 2019, we hit the poor year classes. So they start entering SSB around seven and eight so we will not see the effects of the four year classes in SSB until, um, let's see, when did I say six to uh, 19, 2027-ish, something like that. Um, but what we're going to see is we typically have a huge surge of schoolie fishing and our fishery really grows the number of participants and the number we catch when they start leaving at age three and four from Chesapeake Bay, we are not going to see that big. It's, um, I would guess that the schooling, schooly fishing is, is not going to be great um, for a few years starting this year, next year. 
Okay. What what are the thoughts on the? I don't mean to dominate this, but <clears throat> I have an interest in it. What are the thoughts on the uh, the Hudson River strain? As far as wh where is this all in the mix? Uh, I I don't know. I don't have the index in front of us, but I, I believe, and, and Nick can weigh in if she knows. The Hudson is is okay for now. Um, it's it's a different, very different system because it's one single river along with its tributaries, as opposed to a big, huge open bay like Chesapeake with its tributaries. So it may operate completely different. It's a little bit further north. Um, and our fishery varies in the proportion of what you're catching. Those little tiny fish in the spring are generally Hudson River. But as you get into the legal size fish, uh, depends on when and where you are. Sometimes you're catching Chesapeake Bay fish. Sometimes you're catching uh, Hudson. Um, and so I, I, I forgot the rest of the question. What was it, Khalil? Yeah, that covered it. That, that okay. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Armstrong? I'm not seeing any other hands raised on this subject, Mr. Chair. Nicola, back to you. And then the next slide will also address striped bass um, and a draft addendum that was approved by the board. Um, at the last meeting, um, this is, uh, it addresses a, a singular issue, which would be to potentially allow the transfer of unused coastal commercial quota between states that have um, a coastal commercial fishery. Um, this is an issue that Delaware in particular um, has, you know, requested be taken to public comment and, and the board is, is going along with it. There are a number of options that would um, allow coastal quota to be transferred between states. Um, some of them would put restrictions on it that you couldn't do it when the stock is overfished or that they would apply a, what's being called a conservation tax. So if you were to say if state were to say it would transfer 10,000 pounds, um, it would transfer, you know, 5% less than that as, as a conservation tax. Um, and then there's another option that the board would um, kind of on an annual basis, look at the stock fishery, stock and fishery conditions and determine if transferred would be allowed and, and they could put a cap on the amount that could be transferred. Um, so this was approved for public comment. We have a, a tentative hearing date of December 19th for a Massachusetts virtual public hearing. Um, that schedule should be confirmed and sent out by ASMFC. Um, pretty shortly, and um, you know, written comments will be due by January 13th, um, and final action is expected at the ASNFC's winter meeting. Um, I think most of the the concern um, about this particular action is that it would be latent quota that would most likely be transferred to another state to be activated. So this could lead to uh, you know. Um, some additional harvest from current um, current years, um, and and so could be you know there's some language in the document about how that is could be counter to the recent actions that we've been taking to reduce fishing mortality. Of course, you need to take the the size of the commercial fishery in the context of the of the overall fishery. Um, when, when thinking about you know the, the risk associated with that, but that is something that um, we'll put out information soon about about that hearing so that you can attend that as well. Uh, I see Khalil's hand. Yes, uh, Nicola. Thank you. Uh, question: Were there any any states that that did not meet their quota this year? Um, an, a number of them, yes. Most notably is is North Carolina, which has uh, somewhere around three hundred thousand pounds of quota, and and for the the ocean fishery and um, due to redistribution of the stock, they haven't harvested any of that quota for um, you know five or more years, maybe ten years. So I think uh, you know that that is certainly some quota that states may have an eye on if if this addendum were to allow for the transfer of quota. Is that a population issue or, or an effort issue? That is a, an, an offshore moving into the EEZ where the fishery is not allowed issue. 
Okay, so hypothetical, if if the if they were, were to have a transfer, and Massachusetts said uh, we want to have ten thousand pounds more or twenty, whatever, hypothetical. Um, so we would we would actually be, be contributing to more fish being taken from our area to meet that quota. Is that to, to, to for the transfer? Is that correct? Yes, in in the event that Massachusetts requested a transfer and it was approved, um, then that would you know activate what is otherwise latent quota. Um, of course, you know a state requesting a transfer, a state donating a transfer is still you know voluntary, and it's up to the state to determine if they want to do that. But the board could put some additional controls on how much quota could be transferred in any given year to address you know the type of concerns that I think you're raising. Okay, well, one might just go to public hearing. So th this is approved for public comment and we uh, our, our hearing date is tentatively set for December 19th. I think the ASMC press release with all the state's hearing dates is gonna be released um, within the next week or so. Okay, I see other, I see other hands, so I'm gonna- yeah. Dan, do you wanna add something about the likelihood of, of Massachusetts in, being involved in quota transfers? Kind of, I, I would like to just um, share a couple of thoughts with this commission that, um, his, so when have we ever gone after another state's uh, quota? Um, we've done it routinely for Menhaden. We've done it, um, I think to cover some quota overages, maybe on oh, bluefish, we actually we've done it um, because uh, uh, we, anyway, we've done it for bluefish. It's not typically something that that I or my predecessors necessarily would call the commission up and say, hey, um, you know, what do you think? And so I, I just want to point this out to the commission that if you guys have um, opinions about this, then it, it might it would be. And if this addendum passed, uh, then it, you would you would probably uh, want to weigh in on that. Um, you know, the um, there isn't anything that prevents the director from seeking that quota or or uh, a role for the commission to say, hey, director, hold on, I don't want you to do that. But that doesn't mean the commission couldn't and and any any director worth of salt would be listening to the commission. So I just want to point that out that the commission ne wouldn't necessarily have a, 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 a clear role in whether a, a, a director like like me would chase some of that quota. But you might want to consider that depending on the outcome of this. That's all. I appreciate that input. Thanks, man. Yeah. Mike Piernock has a comment, Mr. Chair. Actually, it's a question, not a comment. Um, if I recall, other states have different size limits uh, for commercial fish in comparison to Massachusetts. Uh, has that been taken into consideration and how that would work? That was the subject of a, a lengthy discussion by the plan development team, which acknowledged that there are different size limits, um, different um, size availability between the states, that, that conservation equivalency has been used to, to modify you know, the size limits and, and the resulting quota, and that the PDT considered some different ways to address that, such as you know, transferring in terms of the number of fish and not the weight. Um, but all of all those types of calculations would have required making some assumptions. And so the PDT's opinion was that, you know, the, um, you know, that, that the, there was that new, we wouldn't really be solving the, the risk associated with the transfers by doing that type of calculation. So um, as written into the, the draft document, um, it would still just be a pound for pound type of transfer with, um, you know, the notation that there is some uncertainty or some differences in the, you know, the number of fish that would be um, harvested in, in transferring quota and by, by weight. Additional question, if, if I can have the floor. Keep going, in my opinion, Mike. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. Um, just to clarify, the commercial catch is based on weight. 
the recreational catch is based on weight or based on size, or if there's a conversion. I, that's my first question, yeah. Um, the, the, the stock assessment converts into numbers caught for both fisheries when, when that is assessed. Um, our, our commercial quotas are, are based on uh, pounds though. I'm, maybe I'm just thinking out loud. So if you're going to take more fish from let's say Maryland and apply it up here or vice versa, I'm just trying to think how that's gonna work because you may be then taking recreational fish up here, but it's not based on, there's a conversion factor from size to weight. I, I'm thinking out loud. I'll. I'll have to think about that more unless something jumps out of you what I'm trying to get at. I'm not sure. I just want to stress that this is only the commercial quotas for the state's um, ocean fisheries and, and not the Chesapeake Bay um, fisheries as well. Right. But if, if Massachusetts, for an example, whether this was, would be or would not be the case, wants to get more quota because we caught our quota and let's say we get it from New York, just as an example, then technically more fish is being taken from up here. I'm trying to think out loud how that wouldn't be recreational fish up here, even though it's going to the commercial quota, because ultimately the total tonnage is going to be taken from Massachusetts is going to increase at the commercial end. Yeah, Mike, I think you're right. It would be kind of within Massachusetts, uh, local fisheries, it would be uh, kind of a de facto uh, gain for the commercial sector to be able to get more quota than otherwise we're allocated. Okay. I, uh, and it would be coming yeah, from the Mid Mid Atlantic. It would be coming yeah. from the from the Mid Atlantic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm good. Thank you. And, and, and sorry, Nicola, I don't know if you really stressed this. Uh, I, I might have spaced out, but this was driven by uh, the state of Delaware that seems to feel that uh, going back into the history of the striped bass management plan, which relied on the landings of the 1970s to allocate and the records associated with commercial landings during that time, that's how they got the quota that they wound up with, are unhappy with that. I don't believe that that there's many other states at the table that are necessarily chomping at the bit to um, to get more a quota, especially that, that we allocate a quota from North Carolina, but Delaware seems particularly um, uh, motivated to, um, to get this. So just, just, I just want to add that. Thank you, Dan, Nicola. All right. Um, uh, we're going to move on to Menhaden then um, on the next slide where um, the board um, had two major actions um, to set the coastwide commercial total allowable catch for the next three years. Um, the decision was made to do a 20% a increase from the limit that has been in place the last two years. Um, this increase was based on the um, results from the, the update single species stock assessment and putting them into the context of the ecological reference points. Um, the last time that the TAC was set, it was based on um, having a 50% probability of not exceeding the ERP um, fishing mortality target. And the board took a more conservative stance this time. Um, had they used the same metric that would have allowed for a larger increase than was selected. Um, but the board chose to um, acknowledge some of the uncertainty in the stock assessment from having some, you know, data gaps caused by COVID um, to acknowledge, um, you know, depletion of other forage species like herring and mackerel. And so they selected um, uh, the rationale for the number um, was to use the 40% the probability of Exceeding the ERP target and then applying an additional 10% buffer on top of that. Um, so that leads to the 233,550 metric ton um, quota, which is uh, you know, 500, over 500 million pounds. Um, the other action by the board was to approve addendum one, um, which looks at some of the commercial fishery management measures. Um, 
the the allocations um, have changed um, based on um, there. There's two things that go into the allocations. Previously, every state had a 0.5 percent default minimum allocation, and then the years of 2009 to 2011 were used to allocate the remaining TAC among the states. Um, and of course, in recent years, uh, their population has increased dramatically in the Gulf of Maine. And, and states in the Northeast have been harvesting more through transfers, through the episodic event set aside. Um, and so we're, um, the decision was made to use the three most recent years, excluding 2020, which had COVID impacts on landings, um, to allocate the, you know, the mo most of the TAC. Um, in addition, um, several states that really don't have commercial fisheries or very minimal commercial fisheries, their default minimum allocation was decreased from 0.5% either 0.25% in the case of um, several states, including uh, South Carolina, Georgia, Connecticut, Delaware, North Carolina, and Florida, and um, Pennsylvania um, only has a default minimum allocation of 0.01%. Um, so on, on the far left side of, sorry, the far right side of this table, you see what the quotas look like for next year. Um, 10.8 million pounds there about for Massachusetts. Um, and then the other action uh, was to remove um, persanes from one of the allowed gears in what's called the incidental catch and small scale fishery allowance. That is that 6,000 pound limit that um, harvesters can use after a state quota has closed um, because of the um, you know, drastic growth in, in, in Maine, particularly from those gears, um, the, that gear was removed from that provision. Um, and in addition, the those landings, the incidental catch and small scale fishery landings are going to be They've always been reported, but they're now going to be, you know, summed up and and totaled and compared to the TAC. And if the TAC, the total of the catch, is being exceeded in any given year based on those landings, the board is going to have to uh, either change the trip limit or the gears that are allowed under that provision. And they can also do so um, through a board action um, so that it can be done, you know, relatively quickly, more quickly than if an amendment or an addendum were approved uh, or were required. Um, and the, the episodic event set aside, that's still 1% that comes off the, the TAC and is uh, available to uh, Maine through New York for use. So the next slide, I just wanted to put our, um, our quota for next year. Next slide, Jared. Thank you. Uh, our, our quota in the context of, you know, where we've been in recent years with our landings um, and at 10.8 million pounds, um, it's actually quite similar to what we've landed in 2021 and 2022. However, that required us um, pursuing transfers rather, um, you know, aggressively. We needed, we had six transfers in 2021 and eight transfers in 2022. We also um, opted into the episodic event set aside in both of those years. So while our, our quota, starting quota is, is, is nearly double from what it was last year, um, my expectation is that the, the, the scale of landings will be quite similar to the last two years, but it will, won't require us to go through as many, jump through as many hoops to get quota transfers and, and such to, to have the fishery perform at, at a similar level. Um, so in terms of, of rule changes, like we will need to change our regulations to take persanes out of the, the small scale fishery allowance. Um, we've also been talking about some other quota management um, type issues, um, compliance issues. We had a scoping meeting um, last month and we we're planning on having another one um, this winter, either December or January to, to further that discussion um, and, and figure out exactly what type of changes we're going to make to the fishery um, in time for the the start um, of next year. So you can anticipate some, you know, first a scoping meeting and then uh, rulemaking probably in early spring to um, make the required change um, and and those to improve the performance of the fishery. And American Lobster, do you Dan? Do you want to yeah. address what, uh, questions? questions? Sure. Um, questions. Questions or comments for Nicola on Menhaden? 
I'm not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. I have one comment. Uh, I'm very proud to work next to Nicola at the table. She is surgical when she brings motions forward. And I know Maine did not want to give up that first same fishery in the uh, you know, 6,000 pound daily trip limit. Uh, I'm just very proud of Nicola's work at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. And we'll <laughs> move on to lobster. Yeah, before we leave Menhaden, um, just my, my couple of thoughts for the commission. Um, when we first enacted the Menhaden plan, uh, I don't know, about 10 years ago or whatever, um, we had a strategy to fill the quota, but to kind of land gently right at the limit. And then with the episodic event set aside, we kind of uh, did away with that. And we kind of got involved with a race to fish with Maine. Um, well, I would, no, no, not against Maine, but there was this race to fish because if you didn't fill your quota, you couldn't get the extra quota. And so I, I think we need to have kind of a serious conversation about uh, kind of our our philosophy and our management strategy about that because uh, now we're at at a pretty good uh, quota, almost 11 million pounds, and there's ways for us to manage this a little bit smarter. You know, in the uh, in the comments that we got uh, that scoping meeting that Nicola referred to, you know, uh, we had some of the bigger operators. You know, talking about the need to still have a large trip limit to, you know, at least at some level, because those fish tend to go into frozen markets. It's different than the smaller boats that don't have the refrigerated seawater. Um, so there's a lot of users that need to be um, satisfied with this quota. And I think uh, we're going to endeavor to create like a new set of rules. But I'm, I'm personally comfortable with an 11 million pound uh, Menhaden fishery. Uh, as it is, there's, there's a lot of angst uh, between the rec and the, and the commercial sector, especially in the Boston Harbor area. Um, you know, we may have to cut the baby in half, uh, you know, every year about access, things like that. But, um, you know, we're gonna have to make a decision about, about uh, kind of retooling this fishery a little bit so that, we have a viable season long fishery with, with, with trip limits we can live with. Uh, um, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's in our best interest to, to try to fill the quarter early and then go, go chasing quarter elsewhere because we may not get it. And then if we don't get it, then, then, you know, our landings come to zero. So it's a, it's a combination of, of us. Uh, well, well, we need to kind of uh, reconcile the fact that we may want to manage an 11 million pound quota you know, or 10.8 in a way that's kind of rational and, and, and planned out as opposed to fishing hard and then searching uh, up and down the coast for more. That's all. I just, I, you know, I want to get the commission ready to, to have that discussion with me. Thank you, Dan. Yep. All right. So lobster, um, I'll take that. Um, one of the things that did come out of the, of the, um, the meeting was the, uh, we did approve to go forward with the uh, potential addendum 27, I believe, which is the so-called resiliency addendum. Um, and this was uh, uh, the, the brainchild of the state of Maine about five years ago, knowing the stock was at an all-time high. Uh, Pat Kelleher, to his credit, said, if this stock starts to decline, I don't want to go into like a two-year negotiation um, I, I want to set up like a trigger mechanism that we can we can enact some rules if we if we sense that the stock or if we measure that the stock has declined to a certain level. So part of the um, part of the debate is how much do you want to decline before you take any actions, and then what are those actions? So what came out of this meeting was uh, a range of of uh, decline measured decline and between 25 and 40%. I think at this point, we were around 18% decline already uh, from, the, uh, from the, uh, the, the, the benchmark. So uh, this is gonna go to public hearing. I think we're gonna hold these hearings as part of the MLA weekend uh, in late March. And so it should be a, a good robust hearing. And, um, and then we'll go, we'll be approving this in the spring meeting in May. Um, so, you know, 
once a trigger is hit, what is the action? And the, the action that's being contemplated is a two-step gauge increase, um, kind of like what we do with Welk, right? We have a small increase followed by no increase followed by a, a small increase in the third year. Um, and this would create a new three and three eighths inch minimum size, which would give us a uniform minimum size for all of our inshore areas, area two out of Cape and area one, which would be uh, hugely beneficial for law enforcement um, in terms of uh, reducing complexity of our regulations. Um, but in addition, there's also some measures about V-notching and there's a bunch of options, um, some, some that I think we could support and, and some not, but you know, one of them is uh, to, uh, make more consistent the V-notch rules uh, in uh, between jurisdictions. Or, and so what I mean by that is, uh, well, you know, what is being targeted is uh, in our outer Cape Cod region, we have about 70 fishermen and about 45 of them have, um, have federal permits. I'm sorry, have state only permits and about 25 guys have federal permits. And those 45 guys have um, the, the rules that apply to them are more liberal in terms of uh, well, how a V-notch is defined, and, and specifically, um, they're allowed to take a much uh, a lobster that has a much more recent V-notch, and one that hasn't, uh, you know, molted in the in the V-notch uh, shrunk over time. But um, you know, and I, that won't be very popular uh, with with those those fishermen. Um, but um, the, the entire board is kind of looking at this as as kind of uh, like low hanging fruit, so to speak, or something that should be reconciled. <clears throat> the other uh, issue that is um, is of importance has to do with the um, the maximum size as well. There could be uh, changes to the maximum size. Uh, currently, those same 40, 40, 45 uh, state-only lobstermen do have no maximum size at all, which um, obviously creates some problems for law enforcement. So we're trying to make the rules somewhat more consistent uh, when we can, if we can. Um, and so those, uh, those will those will be discussed in, in some detail. So um, looking forward to those public hearings, um, you know, this, uh, this March and with final action, obviously hanging over all of this is the, uh, the protected species uh, issues and, and what the federal rules, uh, you know, could do to the lobster fishery. And Bob Glenn is going to be talking about that um, actually next, because I, I think we're going to, um, I don't know if, uh, if, if Nicola has some federal management stuff, particularly to her uh, Mid-Atlantic and ASMFC species, but we're going to soon be into the protected species stuff. So it's been difficult to talk about lobster management, knowing that, uh, you know, there could be a meteor strike that's coming with the, uh, the federal actions in the courts. So I will stop there. Take any questions. Questions or comments the director? Not seeing any hands. All right, we'll move on to a couple of quick hits on other species. Um, we just wanted to let you know that for um, river herring, the um, sustainable fishery management plans that Brad Chase presented on at a previous meeting um, to potentially allow for limited recreational harvest in the Namaskat River and the Herring River um, were approved by the board. Um, so the, the next steps there are, it's kind of in the, in the town's domain now to determine if they want to move forward with um, opening under those management plans. Um, the board also approved an updated shad habitat plan from us, which um, included uh, uh, work that um, Dr. Armstrong has, has um, taken up with the Diadromus team to start a, a five-year stocking project of shad in the Taunton River. Um, and on horseshoe crab, um, most of the discussion was on the Delaware Bay and setting the harvest specifications there. Um, there was a um, improvements made to the adaptive framework model that is is used to do that. Um, and it takes into consideration shorebird forage needs. And there was, you know, con some concern from the public that this would allow for female harvest. Um, of horseshoe crabs in Delaware Bay area, which has not been allowed in prior years, but the board maintained that that no female harvest um, uh, rule for for 2023 at least. Um, 
Uh, but more germane to Massachusetts potentially is that there is a working group which is getting going now that is going to be re reviewing the best management practices for the biomedical handling. Um, so that is something that we may be um, needing to look at um, next year to see if there are changes that we um, want need to, need to or want to adopt to um, our biomedical handling um, procedures. Um, and then briefly, um, I'll note that ASMC did adopt a new de minimis policy. Um, and, you know, de minimis is a status that states can be granted if, if their you know, rules on a certain species are, are deemed, you know, inconsequential essentially to the conservation of the species. And some states have raised issues with having to make annual changes to regulations for species that they have de minimis status for. So this, but this policy um, you know, establishes that the fishery management plans could just set some defaults, you know, minimum measures for certain species. Um, so this is just something that in the future, um, if we're de minimis for a certain species, we may, you know, have an exemption from having to make some annual changes, which will, uh, could lighten our load for certain things, which is nice. Um, so moving forward to uh, the next slide, it's the last one, and just uh, to look at uh, what is on the table for the, the joint meeting of the Commission with the Mid-Atlantic Council. Uh, this is a meeting in Annapolis on December 13th, and um, the focus um, when meeting jointly is going to be on fluke scup and black sea bass and taking the next step to set the measures for next year. Um, the recreational harvest limits for the three species have already been set, um, and now the board and council will be using um, a newly adopted approach to setting the measures for next year, um, where um, you know the confidence intervals around the MRIP estimates are considered, as well as the stock biomass, um, so that the the change that we have to take in any given year is moderated by those factors in ways that it previously wasn't when we just compared the prior year's harvest to the current year's RHL and determined, you know, you know we have to cut by thirty percent or whatnot. So there's some buffers essentially put in around that. Um, at this point, it, it's a little bit soon to say where we are with, with each of these species. Um, the monitoring committee has met, and, um, and if, Jerry, if you click one time on the slide, um, this, is, this is kind of the preliminary results of where it's looking at for the recreational measures, where fluke is going to fall into a 10% liberalization bin. SCUP may fall into the, the no change um, status quo position and black sea bass um, may fall into that 10% um, reduction um, scenario for setting measures next year. I, I'm certain that that result for black sea bass um, is, is still frustrating, um, but I, I I don't have the number specifically, but um, it would be a greater than 10% reduction given harvest in recent years if this new approach had not been adopted. Um, and these, the, the recreational harvest limits for, for these species also take into consideration um, changes that were made to the sector allocations for these three species for the first time next year. Um, I also wanted to note that um, Accountability measures were triggered for both SCUP and black sea bass based on the three past years of, of catch exceeding the annual catch limit on an average basis. But um, Garfo did write a letter saying that additional measures um, would not be needed given all the steps that the council and the commission have taken to date, including those sector allocations, adopting this percent change approach, and then the, the reductions, the rule changes that were made um, this past year. Um, so that was um, a bit of good news that, that Garfo was essentially waiving um, the, you know, the accountability measures that were triggered for those two species. Um, the other thing that the Council and Commission will be discussing is kind of where we are with the next steps of um, developing a addendum or sorry, an amendment that would address um, rec the potential for recreational sector separation you know, for hire and, and private anglers or inshore anglers, and also looking at um, alternative catch accounting um, procedures for the for the recreational fishery. 
And that is, uh, that's what that agenda looks like. And I can take any questions or I'll certainly um, be providing some outcomes at the next commission meeting. Questions for Nicola. Bill Amaru. No, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Nicola, when it comes to the uh, best uh, handling procedures for the horseshoe crab industry that are gonna be discussed, is it possible to reach out to the current harvesters so that you can speak to them directly about what they're doing, what they may believe is the best process and practice for handling the crabs themselves to get people who are on the water dealing with them <clears throat> in the present to comment? Yeah, so, so a working group has been formed. I don't have the membership in front of me, but um, my understanding is that it includes a number of um, harvesters and, and you know, biomedical um, facilities, um, staff members that'll, that will be addressing that um, to make mm -hmm. sure we have that firsthand knowledge. Yeah, right. there's, there's, a good, there's a good resource out there. Of yeah, if I could weigh in on that, um, the, uh, the committee has two representatives from Massachusetts, both, both are uh, employees of the two companies um, Associates of Cape Cod and Charles River Lab. And, and I would just add, Bill, that um, I think historically this, com this group was primarily focused on, on how they were receiving and handling the crabs and then releasing the crabs. But now, since we have a much more robust uh, auditrol fishery for biomedical crabs, I think the discussion was, is probably going to get expanded to that that other, um, you know, the, the, the harvesters. Like, so honestly, the, this is, you, you bring up a good point because I don't think in the past there was uh, all that much to talked about because primarily the, um, the biomedical uh, firms were, um, were either dedicated trawlers like down in Delaware Bay, they have a boat that, that just does that for the company uh, or uh, predominantly hand harvest up in Pleasant Bay. But now this has evolved to a, a much more uh, significant auto trawl harvest. And there is no, no doubt some, um, some injury related to, to the auto trawl uh, experience for some horseshoe crabs. And, and that have to be factored in as well. So, uh, you know, I think we, as a state, we need to look at this because it, it appears to me that uh, we may never reach the, uh, the, the bait crab quarter again, um, if the demand for bait crabs continues to stay low and um, most of the, tar the vessels are going to be supplying the biomedical firm who then are going are firms who are then going to be releasing these alive consistent with the with the regulations. So we're in an interesting time, kind of an inflection point with how we're managing this. And I look forward to the input from all the participants in the fishery. Very good, Dan. I, I know you have an open mind about this. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments from Nicola? Not seeing any, Mr. Chair. And I presume we can move on to federal fisheries management update. And I would presume Melanie Griffin is going to present. No, Melanie is caught up in the uh, groundfish committee meeting today. So she wasn't able to attend. So we're going to uh, dispense with that. There's, that was a, um, there's a short briefing that she provided me at the uh, very end of last week that I'll forward to the commission members that highlights uh, what to expect at the upcoming council meeting. Very good, Jared. Thank Melanie from the commission, please. Will do. Okay, moving along. Detected species management update. Bob, Bob Glenn. Glenn. Yeah, Bob Glenn. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll be very brief today. I don't have any slides. I just want to update you on kind of a, a few key developments over the past month relative to protective species management. Uh, the first one is, is some good news and a, a little bit of a sigh of release, relief. Uh, just recently, last week, uh, Judge Ross in the Washington, D.C. District Court uh, issued a remedy order in the Center for Biological Diversity versus NOAA Fisheries case. Uh, this is the case that recently where the, the, the finding was that 
invalidated the, the National Marine Fishery Service's biological opinion for North Atlantic right whales, as well as their proposed conservation framework. And so he just uh, recently issued that rem a remedy order. Um, the good news is that he, he, he is giving NOAA Fisheries the requested time to develop a new rule. And so in that order, he's ordering that NOAA Fisheries must issue the new rule by December 9th of 2024. That's the time frame that uh, both NOAA Fisheries and, and luckily the, the plaintiffs agreed upon, um, and he is supporting that. Um, he's also giving NOAA Fisheries an ad additional time frame uh, beyond that to develop a new biological opinion. Given the rulemaking and the difficulties associated, uh, the volume of work to try to also develop a, a biological opinion, one that will meet the mandates of the court, courts relative to achieving what's called a negligible impact determination and issuing an incidental take statement for the federal fishery. Um, he's giving them additional time. He did not set a specific time frame. Um, it's, it, it can be after the development of the rule, uh, but he, no, if he also ordered no fisheries to provide updates on that every six months. Uh, and, and with this in mind, um, the with the proposed rule or the final rule coming out in December of 2024, that means most of the additional new Atlantic Lodge Whale Take Reduction Plan rulemaking will be set to take place in for the 2025 fishing season. Um, and in the interim, luckily, the judge, um, despite requests by the plaintiff, is going to continue to allow uh, the lobster fishery to continue um, during the time during this rulemaking time period and during the time period of what takes no fisheries to to issue the biological opinion. So um, th this is good news in that he he didn't he um, he didn't supersede the, the wishes of uh, of no fisheries and he's giving them a reasonable time frame to work out an additional rulemaking. And practically speaking, this really doesn't. Uh, change much from the timeline that uh, what we've been working on through the take reduction team. NOAA Fisheries has, has you know, moved forward with that process, and I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, and so this, what this does is it just allows the current process to continue at, at its scheduled rate. Uh, it doesn't require us to take any uh, emergency action and or levy any additional closures or complete closures of the fishery. So it's good, good news, at least uh, it gives us time to, to work on the issue. Um, the next topic is I just wanted to touch on was, um, I think believe at the last commission meeting, I um, one of the things I updated you on was that um, through this rulemaking process over the last year um, and, and through details in the biological opinion, uh, we found out that um, NOAA Fisheries uh, was no longer crediting the state of Massachusetts in our risk reduction measures for the original Mass Bay restricted area closure. Uh, the reasoning for that is was that that closure went in in 2015 and, and NOAA Fisheries uh, arbitrarily or somewhat arbitrarily decided to use 2017 as the year, uh, as the reference year. Um, and that's related to that's the year they invoked what's called a, a um, unusual mortality event, and that was largely spurred by very large uh, mortality events that occurred up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence beginning that year. Um, and as a result of that, that that puts, you know, uh, additional conservation bur burden on Massachusetts fishermen. Uh, DMF, myself and Director McKernan have been working hard in, in kind of um, advocating and providing additional material to NOAA fisheries to provide support uh, to get that credit back, uh, you know, for, to have them reevaluate it and, and provide that conservation uh, credit back uh, to the mass fishery and so that our conservation burden relative to this Atlantic Lodge will take reduction work uh, isn't is quite as uh, difficult. Um, also along those lines, Commissioner Amadon and his chief of staff, Bob Greco, uh, we've worked with them to draft a letter of support for that credit um, for Governor Baker, uh, and that uh, that was uh, forwarded up the chain to Secretary of the Environmental Affairs uh, Beth Card, and we're hopeful that um, 
hopefully in the near future, uh, there'll be additional support coming from the governor for that measure uh, to, to ensure that Massachusetts is getting uh, appropriately credited for all the, you know, that closure and, and the sacrifices that uh, the mass fishing in industry has taken to protect right whales. And finally, the last thing I wanted to update you on was, is kind of the Atlantic large whale take reduction plan rulemaking. Uh, uh, the, the, the take reduction team met last week during a four day week meeting. Um, one of my staff members, Aaron Burke, who is also the alternate representative in Massachusetts covered that meeting. I, I was away out of state um, for a previously planned vacation at the time. Um, and Aaron did a great job representing uh, DMF there um, and kind of representing our interest during the kind of plan development um, to meet this 90% risk reduction mandate. Uh, and um, it's a very tall task. Um, luckily, what we found in, in the recent weeks from some additional model runs by NOAA Fisheries, and this, again, th these numbers that I'm going to indicate to you do not include uh, any credit uh, for the Mass Bay Restricted Area Closure. Um, coming out of the gate, what they would call a baseline number based on all the rulemaking that this commission did with DMF over the last two years, we're starting uh, at an, an evaluated or estimated 87.8% risk reduction. So in state waters of, of LMA1, which is where our predominant fishery occurs for lobster fishing. Um, this puts Massachusetts kind of in a very unique position, unlike in, really any other jurisdiction for any fishery along the entire East Coast. Uh, the, the work that we did really gets us in, to a point where um, we're in pretty good shape for the state waters portion of our fishery. We may, we, you know, if we do not get, end up getting credit for the Mass Bay restricted area, we may have to take some additional small scale measures. And that, and we've been working on developing those with substantial input through meetings with industry members to try to come up with a few uh, conservation measures that would get us up over 90% if necessary. Uh, without causing major impacts to the fishery. So, so that's really good news. Um, for the adjacent federal waters fishery at LMA, it's not quite as rosy of a picture starting out of the gate um, after the rulemaking uh, for federal waters is we're starting in, at 66.5%. So we have a little bit of a gap to make up there relative to, to meet that 90% mandate. Um, We've worked again with, with fishermen and NOAA fisheries um, and also other jur state jurisdictions like New Hampshire and Maine to, to, to kind of discuss and talk about measures to get that for those federal water portions of LMA1 up to the 90%. Um, it's a difficult task because the, the fishery is quite different across the range from, you know, from well east, down eastern Maine all the way to our portion kind of off of north of Stellwagen and off of Cape Ann. And so it's, it's kind of very different fisheries. Um, these deliberations are ongoing and the, the TRT is going to meet on December 1st and 2nd to try, kind of flush out and get final recommendations. Um, what I anticipate is possible rule additional measures necessary in the federal waters portion would be, would be um, probably the need to close uh, the adjacent federal waters adjacent to the, the our state waters closure uh so extending that mass restricted area in federal waters to include the area that we call the wedge or the hockey stick and then also in, in expanding that north to the new hampshire border for the same time period as our state waters closure uh, so that rule would be consistent between the two so that that would be a, a like likely necessary step to boost to boost up our conservation our risk reduction in in uh, federal waters um, similarly, there may be a uh, need to do some type of a similar closure up off of Jeffrey's Ledge. Um, this, but this is you know, Jeffrey's Ledge. I'm sure you're, most of you are all aware is you know a prominent fishing area for for lobster fishing among other things um, off of the New Hampshire coast, and it's an area where there's uh, fishing be, between you know, Mass there's Massachusetts based boats, New Hampshire based boats and main base boats all uh, kind of fishing side by side. And so this, this adds an additional layer of complexity uh, to the negotiations because uh, each of those jurisdictions are, are kind of in a different starting place. 
have slightly different fisheries dynamics going on. And so, you know, uh, even yesterday evening, we had kind of a substantial call among those states, uh, representatives, Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts to kind of discuss and kind of continue to develop options to deal with kind of that area, what, you know, up off of statistical area 513, Jeffrey's Ledge, or also what's known as Maine Zone G. It's all the same area and we're, um, that, that's going to be a little bit of a challenge. But uh, along those lines, um, you know, we're, we're getting, you know, I'm hopeful that for LMA1, we should be able to come up with something that hopefully isn't, isn't um, too uh, damaging to the fishery there. Um, and I'll have a more detailed update of where that's going at the, the next commission meeting. Uh, for LMA2, uh, this will just wrap up this year. Uh, again, we've been working with Rhode Island is also in NOAA Fisheries to come up with measures. We're starting at about 70% in those areas uh, and through additional measures that were um, developed last week, which includes some additional trawling up scenarios, some changes to the boundaries of the South Island's closure um, and, and possibly the timing. Uh, it sounds like the most recent package is up at close to 87%. And that's for all of area two, that's for state and federal waters. Um, one of the prominent changes that we would have to make is, as you're all aware, for our state waters fisheries close, closure, we left out um, the areas south of Cape Cod, which were Buzzards Bay, Vineyard Sound, and Nantucket Sound. Um, under the current proposal, those areas of all the state waters of LMA2 for both Mass and Rhode Island uh, would, have to, would have to close uh, to get those additional conservation benefits. Um, and so that's something that, um, you know, we may need to bring before the commission at a later date for consideration. Later this afternoon, I'm meeting with NOAA Fisheries and Rhode Island and, and, and other group, um, and all, as well as some industry members to kind of further flush this out. Uh, and so I'll have more, more updates on this uh, coming at the next meeting. And then, and then finally, uh, the only last point on this is we've scheduled two uh, meetings with the fishing industry, one next Monday evening from 6 to 9. It's a virtual meeting um, for LMA1 and LMA OCC to discuss these measures um, and, and try to get some additional feedback prior to the decision-making meeting of the team on December 1st and 2nd. And then the next night from 6 to 9, we're going to do a similar meeting with LMA2 lobster fishers as well as uh, fishers who participate in whelk and fish pot fishing. And so we'll try to solicit some last minute additional input prior to the December 1st and 2nd meeting. Um, and with that, that's that's what I have for a protected species update today. Thank you, Bob. Questions or comments for Bob? Suki? Yeah, thanks, uh, Brian, Jared. I just have a comment, uh, Bob. I just don't know how Massachusetts is going to close down Area 1 uh, fisheries into the federal zone and not have New Hampshire and Maine and anybody else doing the same thing. I just I just can't see it. And it's be such a bad impact. I mean, we've got, we're guys from other states to be able to come and fish with Massachusetts. Guys won't be able to fish. is completely unacceptable. But we'll talk about it next week, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Snoopy. Any other comment? Not seeing any other hand raised, Mr. Chair. Okay, let's move along. We have two subcommittee reports, one permitting and one law enforcement. Permitting, I think it's going to be story read. Yep, we'll start with that. I'm going to share my screen, Jared. Help. Well, I'm going to get going here. I'll try to try to share my screen. But we did meet the permit subcommittee met on October 20th, um, and we had a good first meeting of that group, um, first meeting of that permit subcommittee in seven or eight years. Um, we started with a background on the current limited entry permit scheme and how we arrived at that today, kind of where we are today, and. Um, 
then we went into some of the basic statistics. So the permit and endorsement issuance trends over time, obviously they've gone down regularly um, as part of the limited entry scheme. And then we got into some of the median ages of, of some of the participants in those fisheries. Um, and that was all provided to you with your packet uh, along with the summary of the meeting. So we don't really need to show those, um, but you have, you have those. Um, and from there, we went in and started looking at, um, we started looking at the different issues that we might wanna bring up um, and that included things like um, how to promote diverse permit portfolios, um, encourage new and younger entrants into the fisheries to maintain fishing communities, um, potentially um, standardizing some regulations across permits and endorsements like um, in the coastal lobster fishery, those permits can be transferred um, between immediate family members without consideration of activity on the permit or recent experience. Um, so considering potentially extending that to other limited entry permits and endorsements. Um, so we went through all those types of issues and objectives and talked about many of them. And there is a slide about those in the presentation that we forwarded to you. We got to talk about most of those. So from there, the question is, um, where do we go from there? Um, DMF has some deliverables coming out of that meeting, including analyzing with our statistics project, the activity levels of certain permits and endorsements to inform future conversations. Um, we want to analyze also a specific area, um, the mobile gear fishery south of Cape Cod and um, look at that in terms of um, permits and endorsements. Um, are there complete sets of permits there? Um, so we're gonna analyze that. Um, there was also a suggestion to create um, an industry advisory panel to help this group. And that was a great suggestion. I'm not sure we're ready for that for the next meeting, but soon. So we intend to do this work internally and then bring it back to the subcommittee, um, probably for a meeting in January. Um, we've got a lot going on in our permitting and statistics program right now into December. So we hope to be able to do some of that analysis after that and get the subcommittee back together in January. So I think that's the quick summary of that meeting. I'll take any questions. Questions or comments or stories? I'm not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. I have one question story. So we're not going to even look at the definition for commercial fishermen in the state of Massachusetts. That's not going to be discussed at all. Sure, we can discuss that. It's not something that we got into too much in the first meeting, but we can put it on the agenda for the next one. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Moving along, if there's no other questions or comments, the law enforcement subcommittee. Sure, I'll, I'll be taking that, Mr. Chair. Um, and I'll be I'll be pretty brief on this. We held our annual meeting um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, there were a couple um, items that were raised by by law enforcement with regarding to. Um, regarding quota management issues this past season. Uh, the focus of that discussion was on the Manhattan fishery um, during the limited entry uh, quota management period. Specifically, um, at that those times where the uh, trip limit set at 125,000 pounds and large quantities of fish are being landed, uh, one of the items that was discussed was the potential for a volumetric equivalency or similar standard um, whereby, you know, the fish hold on a um, saner or on the carrier vessel would be marked um, uh, to define a trip limit capacity or that fish be stowed in some manner so that it could be easier to enforce, uh, you know, 125,000 pound trip limit. Uh, there were also some concerns raised this year based on enforcement in incident out of Gloucester, that the current system, which is a single ticket reporting system, whereby the 
fisherman is also the dealer or reports um, that catch as, as a dealer into SAFIS, uh, undermines kind of the transparency of this. And, and we were finding that uh, one uh, individual was underreporting their catch as a bait dealer um, and then selling that catch to, um, you know, an actual bait dealer um, who was dis um, based on the difference in catch records. MEP was able to put together a pretty good case against um, that individual for, you know, exceeding trip limits uh, and, and misreporting. And, you know, that's going to be dealt with in, in the courts and likely with an adjudicatory hearing. Um, but, you know, it kind of highlighted some of the some of the issues that exist with the current single ticket reporting system, um, because there is no secondary or, or second entity that that fish gets reported by. It's all being reported by the same entity. Um, so these are things we're going to be looking at this winter for Menhaden, uh, you know, and probably things that we're going to be wanting to address at that industry meeting that Nicola uh, referenced earlier, uh, where we'll be discussing quota management uh, matters as well. Um, on striped bass, the, the big concern there was the uh, multiple fishing days or consecutive fishing days and um, fish being landed in the middle of the night and dropped off at a dealer location and potentially requiring uh, dealers to actually be present when fish is received. Um, they're thereby disallowing uh, the dropping off of fish at um, at a dealer or unoccupied facility uh, because it, it kind of um, it um, creates chain of custody issues and, and weakens enforcement. Um, another issue that uh, I think the Lieutenant Bass raised at an earlier meeting, I believe maybe the June commission meeting, if memory serves me correct. Uh, is that uh, how striped bass are measured? By by regulation, we state that the tail may be squeezed, um, and this was done historically to allow, um, you know, near legal size fish with a forked tail to be to to be squeezed to make them legal size fish in in, in the recreational fishery or the commercial fishery. Now with the slot limit, there's kind of a game being played on the water as to whether or not the tails could be squeezed or fanned. Uh, particularly in the recreational fishery to meet that um, slot limit. Uh, so MEP requested that we consider adopting more precise regulatory language here, either by requiring the tail to be fanned or requiring the tail to be squeezed, but not allowing both. Um, so those are two things we're gonna be considering uh, this winter as well. Uh, shellfish tagging has been an issue or continues to be an issue. Um, there's been particularly at the dealer level um, where MEP has been encountering um, shellfish dealers uh, with untagged product on their floor. This is something we're bringing up at our uh, annual at our um, DPH MEP DMF uh, meeting that's probably we're hoping to have scheduled um, before the upcoming holiday. Um, additionally, we discussed the um, Shellfish advisory panels consideration to allow um, expanded bulk tagging um, at the recent Dan at the beginning of the meeting said the shellfish advisory panel met um, last week and one of the things they discussed was um, expanding the current allowance which is for grower dealers to bulk tag product um, and bulk tagging is having you know one tag per lot of shellfish rather than a shellfish harvester tag on each bag or container of shellfish. Uh, so it reduces the tagging burden. Um, and expanding that program to all aquaculturalists, uh, should the dealers they sell to want to participate. Um, and, and that would reduce, you know, again, reduce the burden on them. But the at the higher level that the shellfish is tagged, the more chance there is for that um, tag tagged to um or that for, for the shellfish to become untagged or or um you know um chain of custody issues following that um so we we discussed that at some length and then um 
you know, that those are the major uh, topics. Um, uh, Bill Doyle did raise an issue regarding uh, the theft of oysters from an aquaculture grant in Plymouth. Um, and, and there being some kind of some type, some municipal struggles on, on how to handle that situation. Um, so our shellfish program um, is going to be considering, you know, working with policy staff to consider developing operational um, procedures for municipal constables that we will, um, you know, work with MEP on so that the municipal constables uh, can kind of have a standard procedure whereby they, they, they manage those type of enforcement activities. So those are the big items coming out of uh, this year's law enforcement subcommittee meeting. So the agency has some homework to do over the next couple months to address these, uh, these issues. So I'll take any questions if there are any. Dan, you wanna jump in? Yeah, Jared, uh, was there any thought about going to the other states to talk about the measurement of striped bass to try to get conformity um, among the, the jurisdictions? Because we're all supposed to have the same rules. Sure, that's, you know, that wasn't discussed at the subcommittee meeting, but that's, that's certainly a good, good point. All right, Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any. Oh. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Moran. Hey, Jared. <clears throat> no, I was just going to say I, I can reach out to the um, the other members of the Atlantic states and just find out what their what their regulations say about measurements, and and I can get back to the committee. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Colonel. If there are no other questions or comments, we can move on to other business. Commission uh, comments, and I'll start with Tim Brady. Tim? Yep, no, uh, no comments. Just uh, thank you to everyone. We discussed an awful lot today. I learned a lot today. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Khalil? Well, I'd like to say is uh, we have a lot to be thankful for, and especially during this time of year. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Hopefully everybody's safe and happy and it was a great meeting, thank you. Kelly Edmondson. No comments, thanks Ray. Thank you. Michael Pierna. I'll move along to Suki and come back to Michael. Suki. Yeah, thanks Ray. Just one, I should have brought it up earlier probably. I just wanted the status of some of the adjudicatory hearings that the states held lately, if there was any final uh, decisions made on any of them. They can, um, they can I, email me if they wanted to, if they don't want to talk about it now. I, I can quickly report um, there has been one, the matter of Tim O'Keefe has been uh, settled with a multiple year permit suspension and that uh, settlement was approved by the uh, the magistrate and the director and will go into effect um, beginning next fishing year. Um, and the other remaining um, one's coming out of the uh, last year's um, gear enforcement uh, work are, are still pending. I think there's uh, three or four of them that are still pending. Okay, thanks, Chair. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you, Sookie. Thank you, Sookie. L.A. Amaru. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to say, I remember in my youth, I heard a, an old fisherman say uh, going home to have his Cape Cod turkey on Thanksgiving Day. He had been out jigging. And I looked at him and I said, well, at that time, and there are no turkeys living on the Cape. <clears throat> he said, oh, well, come on, young man. That's, you know what that is? That's an 18-pound codfish in the oven. That's a Cape Cod turkey. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you, Bill. Bill Doyle. Yes, um, I'm all set, Ray. Uh, best wishes to everyone for a happy holiday. Thank you, Bill. And I'll, I'll close out this uh, part of the meeting. My gratitude and thanks to the entire DMF staff that makes these commission meetings happen. I didn't thank people individually today as they presented. So thanks to all of you and to the entire DMF staff, a happy Thanksgiving. And as always, I'm very much impressed with this commission. 
uh, commission members partook in public hearings, which was delightful to see. And just from the flow of the conversation today, people study their packets when Jared sends them out. So I wish the entire commission membership a delightful and a thankful Thanksgiving. And now I'll open it up to public comment. Mr. Chair, before we go to public comments, the director um, wanted to add something. Yeah, Ray, just one more piece of business it has to do with the next meeting. And um, so this is kind of a fluid situation where uh, we're thinking of like a December 20th. Uh, it's the Tuesday before Christmas uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's the letter that um, Ron has recommended and, and, and you've taken on uh, final review and approval of that. Um, and then uh, we do have an opportunity to bring the commission up to date on the outcome of the meetings we're going to have talking to the fluke, uh, fluke fishery participants and the uh, horseshoe crab fishery participants, which is there's going to be scheduled for December 13th. And then finally, um, on fluke trip limits, it's a little awkward because uh, if you recall, we went to um, uh, an, uh, to uh, I won't say emergency action, but through the authority to increase the trip limits to 10,000. We did that. Those are at 10,000. Then on January 1st, the fishery is scheduled to open at 3,000, and it may be um, useful to keep that fishery open at 10,000 only because uh, our winter fishery um, is probably going to underperform again. We have about 400,000 pounds left on that million pound quota, and we're thinking that, um, that we might want to run a public comment period over the last over the next couple of weeks so that the commission could convene and um, approve a recommendation if, if we so choose to increase the trip limit beginning January 1 to 10,000 pounds to open the fishery so there's no change from December 31st to January 1st. So there's, those are three or four reasons to have a brief meeting. And if we promise to be brief, I was wondering if we could get the consensus of the commission to hold a December 20th uh, morning meeting. I don't think it'll take more than about, I don't know, Jared, hour and a half. Yeah, that's what Two I would hours. I'd, I'd try to keep that agenda under an hour and a half. Yep. Okay, well, can I open this with a comment? Sure. Uh, if we could make it a 10 a.m. meeting, I can run it. I have a 7.30 a.m. appointment with a thumb joint surgeon okay. at Brigham and Women's in Foxborough that morning at 7.30. So those meetings, you know, it's a consult that will last more than 15 minutes, a half hour. I could definitely be back in Chatham by 10, 10 a.m. to run that meeting. Sure. Sure, this is virtual, so I'm, I'm rather flexible on um, when we hold this, the traffic to get here isn't all that bad. Yeah, and, and, and we'll promise to end it by noon. How's that? And how does the rest of the commission feel? Does anybody want to Are there objections? We're assuming it's going to be virtual, correct? Yes. It, it will absolutely be virtual. Okay. I have no issue with it. Khalil has. I'm not seeing any objections, Mr. Chair. I'd be fine with it. Thank you, Commission members. I appreciate that. Uh, I can move to public comment now. Yeah, so I'll give my normal spiel. Members of the public, if you have a comment, uh, we'll, we'll take it at this time. Use the raise hand function and we'll recognize you um, in the order that you raise your hand and, uh, you know, the, 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 the chairman will give you an opportunity to speak. Uh, before we do that, Ray, I just wanted to wanted to, 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 to touch on one thing that Dan said that we're going to be we will be holding two industry meetings December thirteenth, um, the for uh, beginning at, at our BSMS facility in New Bedford, beginning at four p.m. that day. We'll have a fluke meeting which will run about two hours, and then we'll have a horseshoe crab meeting that will run about two hours. Um, so. Those will be in-person meetings on December 13th um, to discuss kind of quota management issues, best management practices, um, and conservation. Yeah, I, I, I won't be able to attend. I'll be down at that joint meeting in Maryland. Yeah. In Apple, so. I All expect right. I'll get a notice out tomorrow so commission members can look for that and attend if they like. If not, we'll report back at that December 20th commission meeting. So 
as much as it's in person, it won't be a hybrid. It won't be a hybrid. No, we done that. Uh, we haven't had much success at that SMS facility running hybrid meetings. All right, thank you, Jared. So look forward to Jared's invitation for that in-person meeting on the 13th. Now I'll move now public comment. Beth Cassoni, good afternoon. Beth, you recognize. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I would ask if um, possible, can the DMF send out a reminder to the fishermen that are going to be participating in the virtual meetings um, next week, as I've talked to a couple of them and they didn't see the email or got lost in their email. And I think it would be wise. Maybe we could send it out on um, Friday. Yeah, sure. No problem, Beth. We sent up an, an update yesterday, but we can do another one on Friday just to put it fresh in their email boxes. No problem. That's great. And I, I'd like to thank Erin Burke for her time last week. She did a great job, Bob, in your stead. And, you know, we're looking forward to getting through this um, next round of right whale measures. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you, Beth. Same to you. Any other public comment, Jared? Phil Coates, how, how we doing, Phil? Good afternoon. Phil, good afternoon, you're recognized. You're muted, Phil. How's that, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. good. Uh, well, since we've now, I guess there's now a new schedule and with the December meeting, I don't have to give everybody holiday wishes, but I will convey Thanksgiving, good wishes to everyone. And I do want to take this opportunity to applaud Ron Amadon as commissioner. He has done a wonderful job during his tenure, and I certainly hope that can continue. Uh, and I just wanted to mention uh, to the commissioner, if he's still there, that the Strohmeyers send their best greetings to you. You met them at the field trial hearing. Elizabeth Strohmeyer, of course, couldn't make the uh, the uh, MFAC memorial meeting or uh, anniversary meeting, but they're down in hunting deer. Uh, striped bass, uh, I want to thank Armstrong. I listened to the uh, striped bass board meeting and uh, Mike was the cautionary member of the board that kept, and he mentioned it to today. He's concerned obviously about the uh, issues and concerning the low recruitment, which are particularly interesting because uh, Virginia, other than this year, has had decent year classes on their side of the Chesapeake, but unfortunately, Maryland continues to suffer. Uh, last but not least, uh, I have to mention, because there was a permit subcommittee meeting, we filed a petition with the division about three years ago with regard to overhauling the striped bass fishery, the limited entry, or creating a limited entry fishery. And we're yet to hear a response. And I'm not sure in reviewing the statute whether a response is mandatory, but I'd like to kind of keep this in the in play. So I just want to mention that uh, we should have a discussion about what to do about the striped bass fishery. As uh, Mike mentioned, landings were up this year, catches were up. Uh, and I'm concerned about that. I think there's going to be implications. But I know several commercial guys that said they've had their best year ever fishing for striped bass. And some of them fish in a very interesting way. And so anyway, that's all I'll say for now. Best wishes to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Happy Thanksgiving to you. And we look forward to your comments at our December meeting. Thank you. Take care. Jared? I'm not seeing any other hands raised. I, I am going to call on Jamie Bassett, though, because I, he, had, he had asked earlier in the day, contact me directly, if he could have an opportunity to speak. So I just wanted to, um, you know, see, confirm with Jamie that, that he either does or does not. Jamie Bassett, you're recognized. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, I, I, I was just uh, listening and I, I have no comment. Um, um, it, I thought, what a great meeting to attend. 
and um, I wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you much, Jamie. Same to you. Jared, any other public comment? No other public comment, Mr. Chair. We can move to a- I would like to move to adjourn. Somebody please make the motion. I'll make the motion, Suki. Thank you, Suki. I need a second. I'll second it, Shelly. Thank you, Shelly Edmondson, Dr. Edmondson. All those in favor? I'm not seeing any objection. This meeting is adjourned.